thanks to Professor Yang Huaming sharing a scientific and active idea. Like you said, please realize that not all hope is lost. We do have only one Earth, but we have more than one way of restoring it. Thank you so much. Thank you for your attention. Okay, now let's listen to the voice about biodiversity from the youth representative, Ms. Tao Zixuan. Ms. Tao Zixuan is currently an IGCSE student in Dawich College, Beijing. She has, okay, sorry. She has a keen promoter for species conservation over the past few years. Her artwork, Bluefin Tuna, which aimed to protect Bluefin Tuna from commercial hunting, was selected to participate in the CMS COP12 of United Nations Environment Program. Okay, it's time for Cao Zixuan's speech. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Cao Zixuan. I'm a senior school student from Beijing. I have a passion for bioscience and a deep love, deep love for the abundant biodiversity on our planet. And that's what brought me here on this International Biological Diversity Day. This forum covers a wide range of important and pressing topics. I want to thank the organizers, organizers of this conference for giving me this privilege to speak, to, to speak here today. It's an honor. Our understanding of the Earth's issue grow as we get older. As teenagers, we become aware of the many dangers facing our planetary ecosystem and how fragile it is today. Through learning in, inside and outside of classrooms, we realize that many species are seeing their numbers decline at an alarming rate. And some rare species are on the verge of extinction as we speak. Oftentimes, human activities and our consumption-driven growth model are directly responsible for the destruction of habitats for plants and animals. And while we progress into the future, it is important to secure our only living habitat. Because if we don't, we too, as a species, will run out, will run out of place to live. We need to act together, you and me, everyone. On land, Earth's resources are being depleted at a rate far exceeding any forms of replenishment or regeneration. Forest and animal habitats are diminishing due to expansion of human activities. Many rare wild species are facing imminent threats of extinction, such as koala bears in Australia and Manchurian tigers in China. In the oceans, marine life is also fighting for survival. Pollution from oil spills and waste dumps and overfishing all pose serious challenge for ocean habitats. We, we must all have seen images of turtles, turtles suffocating on plastic waste or whales trapped in fishing nets to starve to death. These tragedies are happening every day. We must act to protect our planet, restore its ecosystems and rebalance our relationship with other species that share this planet. Global warming is causing irreversible damage. Glaciers are melting at an unprecedented pace. This is just a precursor to more extreme climate changes and weather patterns. In recent years, the world has witnessed some violent bushfires, extreme floods, and volcanic activities on ever increasing magnitudes and frequencies. Rising sea levels threaten to submerge island countries that are close to the sea. We must take them on these alarm bells sounded by Mother Earth seriously. Hopefully by working together, we will find a solution to these present issues and create a harmonious environment for all living species. This will be an ecological civilization program, a joint effort by, by the global community. For it to be successful, this program calls for a positive and proactive mind share from each and every one of us. The COVID-19 pandemic is a humbling reminder of how vulnerable the human society is. We must act as a responsible global citizen in order to achieve long-term sustainability. Let us join hands and start taking actions so that children of my, gener my generation and many more generations to come will have, a place, will have a place to live and thrive. Thank you. 
Thanks, Ms. Cao Zixuan. It was very innovative speech. Yeah, it is very abundant from the youth idea. The youth representative participated in this summit and expressed that the scope of biodiversity protection as broad can be from people all works of life. All right, right. Thank you so much. Next expert is Mr. Joe Scallens. Ms. Joe Scanlon is former Secretary General of CITES. Let's listen to her speech on Biodiversity Day about illegal wildlife trade. Thank you to my good friends and colleagues at the China Biodiversity Conservation and Green Development Foundation for today's generous invitation. Warm greetings to my fellow panelists and to all participants joining us today, and a very happy International Day for Biological Diversity. Now today I've been asked to talk about illicit trafficking in wildlife. And there are many things that need to happen at all levels if we hope to seriously tackle illicit wildlife trafficking. And this includes addressing both demand and supply, working across source, transit and destination countries, building the capacity of the criminal justice system in each country, and having in place and enforcing sound national and international laws. And we have some wonderful speakers today who are going to touch upon these issues. What I'm going to focus on is the need for enhanced international cooperation and of the importance of strengthening the international legal framework that facilitates such cooperation and including recognition of the need to seriously tackle these crimes in the global biodiversity framework that is currently being negotiated under the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. Now, when I'm talking of wildlife, I'm including all wild fauna and flora, including all fritzies, not just the limited number of species that are listed under CITES, which only constitute about 0.5% of our world's 8 million species. Now, why do we need to scale up our international efforts? Well, reports from the IPBS, UN Environment Programme, UN Office of Drugs and Crime, the World Bank, amongst many others, graphically describe the severe environmental consequences of illicit trafficking in wildlife, for our climate, ecosystems, wild animals and plants, as well as for human and animal health. But the damage goes deeper than that. We know that these crimes involve the theft of natural resources from local indigenous communities. They discourage legitimate investors and they undermine the governments of source countries. And they do this by depriving them of revenue, fueling corruption, destroying livelihoods, injuring and killing rangers and creating national and regional instability. Now, if we add the cost of the impacts on eco then the World Bank estimates the cost of these crimes at a staggering one to two trillion dollars each year. Successfully tackling these crimes demands high levels of cooperation at national and international levels. And for some time now, I've had the opportunity to help galvanize support amongst countries, law enforcement agencies, and many others to combat and prevent illicit trafficking in wildlife. I had the honour to serve as CITES Secretary General for eight years, from 2010 to 2018, at which time I was directly involved in multiple collective efforts to achieve this objective, including establishing, institutionalising and attracting resources for the International Consortium on Combating Wildlife Crime, known by its acronym IQIC. And I had the great opportunity of chairing this initiative for its first eight years. Now, I mention this because I've seen for myself the progress that we've made through heightened international cooperation and national action. And these endeavours have resulted in greater attention and resources being dedicated to the issue. And this is very encouraging. But it's equally clear that these gains are both insufficient and fragile. Notwithstanding these efforts, we're still nowhere near ending illicit wildlife trafficking. Instead, we see these crimes continue to escalate against a backdrop of rapidly changing environmental, human health and security challenges. Just look at the plight of the pangolin, for example. Despite being given what is called the highest level of protection under CITES, poaching and trafficking levels, 
with thousands of these amazing animals continuing to be illicitly taken, trafficked, and consumed. And just a few months ago, park rangers were tragically killed in an ambush in W National Park in Benin. Horrific incidents like these are happening far too often. We must better tackle the demand and the trafficking to relieve the pressure on our brave rangers who are serving in the front lines. And this is going to require much deeper international cooperation and national action right across source transit and destination. Now, there comes a point where one must recognise that what is being done is not enough. And my focus today is on the international legal framework and on the need to address these issues through our new global biodiversity framework. Now, as regards our current international legal framework, it is not fit for purpose in addressing today's global environmental realities, especially as it relates to the scourge of illicit trafficking in wildlife. Now, CITES is providing some form of legal framework, and I know this convention extremely well. It's a convention I'm very fond of, but it is limited in its scope. It was not designed to deal with illicit trafficking in wildlife or transnational organized crime. It's a 50-year-old trade-related convention, not a crime-related convention, and it does not oblige states to criminalize breaches of the convention. It only applies to cross-border movement of wildlife and not, for example, to illegal harvesting or poaching. And it applies to a limited number of species. And CITES is not a natural forum for the enforcement or wider criminal justice community. However, in the absence of any alternative at the time, we made the best possible use of CITES to help galvanize international cooperation and national action. And we did this with some success. But CITES does not provide the international legal framework or the global policy framework we need and a comprehensive legal regime for tackling illicit trafficking in wildlife within the framework of international criminal law rather than trade law is way beyond the scope of CITES, as is a comprehensive policy framework. Now, I'm not sure if you know this, but there are over one million legal trade transactions of listed species reported under CITES every year. And CITES has its work cut out for regulating this legal, sustainable trade, which is where it must direct its efforts. Giving it to organisations that have the mandate and the expertise to tackle transnational organised crime. And we must address all species that are being trafficked, not just the 38,000 species listed under CITES, which, as I said earlier, is about 0.5% of the world's 8 million species. And the UN World Wildlife Crime Report notes that millions of species that are not listed by CITES may be illegally harvested and traded, especially timber and fish. Now, it makes no sense to only pay attention to a limited number of species, and usually only once they are already threatened with extinction. We need to intervene early to stop a species getting to the point of being endangered. Now, leaving things as they are is not going to cut it. We're going to have to shake up the status quo and make transformative changes to our system if we want to change course. Now, there are many disparate non-binding resolutions and initiatives in this area, from CITES, the UN Crime Commission, the UN Environmental Assembly, the UN General Assembly, and more. And they're all very good in their own right, but they're not legally binding, and they have not generated political support engagement of relevant agencies, or the necessary financial or human resources or national action that is required if we're going to end illicit trafficking in wildlife. Now, while there is this scattered array of resolutions, there's no global centre of gravity for advancing cooperative efforts to combat and prevent illicit trafficking in wildlife or for reviewing the progress being made. We must now embed both combating and prison trafficking in wildlife where it belongs, namely into the international criminal law framework with the UN Office of Drugs and Crime, the UN conventions that it hosts, the UN Crime Commission, and the UN Vienna Duty Station unequivocally leading a global cooperative aided effort, including the progress that we're making, reviewing the progress that we're making. Now, a binding legal agreement will provide an enduring global platform that will act as a catalyst for heightened international cooperation and national action, 
both of which are desperately needed. And if adopted, a protocol would be the first time that a crime that has an effect on the environment is directly addressed through the international criminal law framework and be the first global legally binding instrument to include an agreed definition on illicit trafficking in wildlife. Now, I am delighted to say that on the 20th of May, just two days ago, a resolution presented to the UN Crime Commission by Angola, Kenya and Peru, and co-sponsored by Gabon and Malawi, amongst others, was adopted by consensus. This historic resolution titled Strengthening the International Legal Framework for International Cooperation to Prevent and Combat Illicit Trafficking in Wildlife invites member states to, and I quote, provide the UN Office of Drugs and Crime with their responses, including the potential of an additional protocol to the UN International Organised Crime to address any gaps that may exist in the current international legal framework to prevent and combat illicit trafficking in wildlife. And China played a very active and important role in the negotiation and adoption of this resolution, which is going to be implemented over the coming year and we hope that you all play a very strong role and take a very strong interest in seeing it fully implemented. Now, we also need to fully recognise illicit wildlife trafficking within the global biodiversity framework, which is still under negotiation and will be adopted in Kunming, China later this year. And we need to include within this framework a specific target on ending these highly destructive crimes. Colleagues, finally, to put it in a nutshell, it is the local and indigenous communities living amongst wildlife, legitimate investors and the governments of source countries, as well as our global biodiversity, climate, health and security that should benefit from the world's wildlife and not organised criminals. Thank you again for the invitation and a very happy International Day for Biological Diversity to all of you. Thanks to Mr. Joss Gallen for his contributions to the World Life Treat and support this summit. Thank you so much. It's very meaningful to protect biodiversity from wildlife treat. Okay, thank you so much. We know biodiversity requires, requires the participation of all people. We have established 183 com community conservation areas since 2016, pro pro proving that people's participation can make an important contribution to biodiversity conservation. Okay, okay. at the end of the opening ceremony, we invited A De Gu Lie, a young female artist from the Yi nationality from Yunnan. She is the director of con community conservation areas of CBC GDF. She used her wonderful singing to mobilize the local community to protect the endangered species uh, like gibbons. She recorded a song to the International Biodiversity Day. Please enjoy it.
Okay. Thank you for uh, Ardu Gulis sound. Using the, the sound to express the hope to protect the biodiversity. Well, it's time to session one, hosted by Professor Fred UV. Welcome, Professor Fred UV. It's your floor. Bonjour. Hello. Ni hao. Guomenta. All greetings in every language possible. Uh, the theme that we are working on these days is a very simple one. It's share a shared future for all life. And I'd like to start off with a little story, a true story, uh, that will show you a little bit the kind of challenges that we must address. A few years ago, actually a few decades ago, and this is a true story, uh, there was a two country, there were two countries sharing the same border. But they also shared the same dispute because for generations there was indecision as to exactly where the border lied. And there had been over the years a number of wars that had cost the lives of many, many young soldiers from both countries. And it seemed that there was no possible solution for this dialogue, for this terrible situation, until one day a wise man went to visit one of the presidents and said this phrase, is it written anywhere that every piece of land on the earth must belong to only one country. And then he went to see the other president and repeated the same message. Uh, the Brazilians have a wonderful phrase for a good listener, half a word is enough. And in both cases, the two presidents started to think, well, if that's the case, if it's really not essential for a piece of land to belong to only one country, what could we do? And both countries said, well, we have a legitimate objective, a legitimate goal, and that is to protect our nation's heritage, our nation's territory, our nation's resources. How could we do that in the light of this little simple little statement? And they got together and they started to talk. How could we protect our goal, our absolutely genuine and legitimate goal, and yet stop this carnage? And they came to a very simple solution. And that was to make this territory an international territory under the stewardship of both countries. And that both countries would reap the benefits of if minerals were found, which was very improbable. And at that time, nobody really thought in terms of biological resources, but their understanding was broad enough to even encompass that. And so what happened is that a, a, a bloodbath, an area of great death and destruction, became an area of peace. And what they found very soon is it became a very interesting tourist attraction. And so you, what we see here is that if you can work to achieving legitimate goals uh, and, and find a, dial, a way to dialogue, then you can achieve great things. And this is very true also when we look in the area of uh, of biodiversity, but even in the area of the illicit trade, and we'll talk about more about that uh, later this evening or this afternoon. Uh, today, when we look at the situation of the uh, convention, we see one very interesting area, a question, how should the world share billions of bits of genetic data stored in computers around the world. 
And if we think really, what are the legitimate goals of the main stakeholders in this, in this discussion? If we look at the developing nations, they're rich in biodiversity. Uh, and they argue that developed nations have exploited their natural heritage for commercial gain. For example, using plants collected in the tropics to develop new crops and new drugs. And they've never shared the benefits. And this is really a thing. So they say, well, our legitimate objective, our legitimate goal is to participate fully as the owners of this biological treasure trove that to, 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 to share in the, the benefits. On the other side, scientists say, uh, we need this access, unhampered, unlimited access to biological information. And if we, do, if we have that, we can work on the great problems of pandemics, the great problems of hunger, the great problems that the world is facing. But without this, if people will hoard it for themselves, if countries will not share it openly, we have a, we face a continuing great problem. And so we have two legitimate objectives. How do we how can we bring these together? How can we find a way to to create an environment of peace. And one of the ways, and this is what was discussed very much in Geneva, was to create a real joint project where the people from the developing nations, especially, and the scientific community can sit together and find the right uh, solutions, find the right uh, ground. It, it's not a ground of compromise. It's, it's not a ground of uh, uncaring. Okay, I don't care what you think. I'm just going to do it. Uh, it's really to find a way that uh, the, is a, a very valuable uh, resolution and one that will go on for generations. So, and it, it's interesting if we look back just a little bit. Uh, the Nagoya uh, Convention uh, looked at this problem quite a few years ago and came to a very good conclusion. But it was looking really at biological samples, not at uh, digital sequencing data, digital sequencing information, because that was not foreseen, nobody at that time realized what was going to happen. And so the solution of the Nagoya principles is, is a great step, but it's not one that will work today. And we have to think also of what will work tomorrow, what will be the challenges tomorrow. So I think what we have to find now is, and we, we, are, we are working together, people from CBC, GFD and BGI, work together in Geneva to try and help promote this kind of dialogue, this kind of discussion, this kind of joint project. And we hope that in uh, the work together in Nairobi at the end of, of June, we will bring this even further. And we're seeing now people are beginning to think in terms of this joint project. So there's a big, big challenge. Uh, we're far, far away from an adequate solution, one that respects the uh, objectives, the legitimate objectives of each. We're not really interested in illegitimate objectives. People who would like to get something for nothing, people who would like to hoard data, these are not really what our concern. Our concern are really the legitimate goals of the key shareholders. And we're looking at ways to do this. So this morning, we'll talk a little bit about it. We've got a couple of very uh, top uh, speakers that will join us uh, to help you. And what we ask of you is please talk with your government. Please talk with your scientific community. Please talk 
with your owners of biological data and ask them to really, with an open mind, contribute to this discussion, to contribute to finding a, a, a solution that is really just for everybody and one that will endure uh, the changes that time and technology will certainly bring to us. Okay, with that, I, I would like to now turn uh, the uh, meeting over to the next uh, speaker, which is uh, uh, Hu Yanjie. Okay. Uh, Yanjing, can, can you help us log in? Hu uh, Yanjie? Okay, okay. So I, I, I'm coming. Sarah, wait. Please wait. Okay, up. good. I told me. <laughs> Sorry, because okay. I, I thought I, I should be later than here. So. Right. Okay. Uh, so let, let me first share my uh, screen. Yes. Okay. That's wonderful. Okay, Welcome, okay. by the way. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so lucky because I was in, I was invited uh, in uh, la uh, uh, last evening. So so I'm sorry I haven't uh, prepared the uh, a PowerPoint in English. But I I will I was speaking English. I hope uh, hope uh, it is. Uh, it, it will work. Don't worry. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So so let me find my uh, PowerPoint. Uh, just wait a moment. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, can you can you see the screen now? Uh, yes. Yes. I okay. perfectly. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so hi everyone. So uh, it's my great honor um, to be invited to uh, join today's discussion. Um, I, I uh, first I think I I, I could uh, briefly uh, introduce. Um, myself, uh, I was um, uh, I, I'm a now a research fellow in Zhejiang University. So in the past ten years, I'm working on the uh, global governance. Uh, this theory uh, and my research field is uh, biotechnology. So so in the past maybe ten years, I think I, I I do many research, including my PhD essays about the human genetics data uh, global governance. And so it's my great honor to see Professor Huai Ming Yang is also here. I'm I, so uh, so you are my role old the uh, the uh, role model in the uh, global governance of data sharing. And the recent several years, I'm started to think about the DSI issues, uh, which means there's no human uh, genetic data. And uh, so today I will briefly introduce some work I'm doing now, but I, I think I will uh, uh, introduce uh, one my uh, a recent proposal, and because it is more related to our today's discussion. Okay, so the first, the background, when, when I think about this story, this topic is just like uh, Professor, you mentioned, uh, the uh, digital sequence data is very, very important and is necessary to, uh, uh, to explore some new global governance institutions. And we see that the DSI's definition is very complicated. And so, but uh, at least we, we have a very uh, a basic common sense that the uh, digital sequence data should be very important because it is very important for agricultural and for the uh, uh, food safety and also as for the medical and also for the industry and as well as the uh, uh, biodiversity protection. Okay, so. Uh, I, we see just as you mentioned that the, there is a very a dilemma in global governance of uh, digital sequence data because on one hand, uh, many developing countries, they think about that this is very uh, a valuable resource and they they are think about the uh, uh, the uh, uh, think about the uh, uh, some of the new rules on how to protect this kind of data. But on the other hand, many uh, scientists and also especially from uh, uh, developed countries, they think this, this is quite important for global data sharing, just as what we have done uh, when the in the human gene uh, uh, human gene uh, genome uh, project, right? So this is a very 
for a great tradition in the scientific community. So how to address this uh, dilemma? And what I did before is I just make a brief review of what kind of global governance institutions which have been uh, proposed uh, in the uh, era of the uh, 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 genetic data, uh, not, not genetic data, but the plant genetic resources. It's not a data, but it's a genetic resources. So we can see there, in fact, there are different, so we call the international regime. They are conflict, they are some parts cooperate, but some parts conflicting with each other. For one hand, there are some international regime, just as CBD, and it's also as its protocols under the CBD, which uh, emphasize the uh, uh, sovereignty, right, for to protecting this kind of uh, plant resources, genetic resources. But we also have the uh, FAO and ITPGRFA, which uh, contribute a lot to for the uh, for the resource sharing around the world. And on the other hand, they also have some conflicting. A relationship with the another international regime is uh, uh, the WTO, TRIPS. So this kind of regime, they emphasize the uh, uh, protection, IPR protection. So they have some cooperation, but they also have some confliction with each other. So, and uh, now what we do is we find that this kind of existing international regime, in fact, they have already have some uh, conflicting with each other and they also, um, also, they have also some new discussion about the DSI by each of them uh, separately. Okay, so uh, here is uh, some, uh, uh, I, I think I, I don't know why. Okay, so so we make a very little brief, a very a short brief uh, review of uh, each regime. For example, like the, under the CBD, right? We have already started this uh, issue since 2014, right? And uh, in under the FAOs, we have discussion uh, since 2012, and under the uh, WTO and the other uh, IPR regime they also have some discussion, okay, recently. But the uh, problem is that this kind of different regime, they have, they have not very close dialogue with each other. So we wonder that whether the uh, DSI global governance could be uh, cooperated, okay, under the uh, current, this kind of global governance regime complex. Okay, so here uh, we are, proposing some ideas of how to address this conf conf uh, con uh, confliction issues, just as uh, Professor Fred mentions about. Uh, so one idea we think about is just, okay, we follow the uh, old path, right? So for the uh, CBD, for the uh, regime of uh, uh, IPR protection, and the, for the uh, uh, regime of FAOE, they work um, independently with each other. Okay, so, but uh, here maybe it could be some space for dialogue, but it could be very difficult and very challenging. And uh, here we, here at the last of this part is uh, we um, make a uh, recently, uh, I'm working with my colleagues in uh, Zhejiang University uh, who are who they are working on the AI artificial intelligence and also the computer technology as well as we also have some dialogue with the college in uh, BGI before and also some uh, professors in FAO. In fact, we are now uh, proposing a new idea in global governance for DSI, but it's uh, just a theoretical model. Okay, so it's really my honor, privilege to introduce this uh, initial idea here to uh, to uh, give your feedback and any comments and also any critics about this uh, model. And uh, I we really want to uh, to find the. Uh, uh, practice, whether it is a promising or whether it is practical or whether we can cooperate to work together on this kind of a new idea. So let me very briefly to introduce this uh, uh, propo a proposed strategy. 
Okay, so we, we know that the uh, as uh, just like, like I uh, introduced before, the uh, dilemma between the developing countries and developed countries is uh, very obvious. Okay, and uh, it's uh, very difficult for them to make a, a consensus on how to balance the uh, uh, data global sharing and the protection of data under the idea of the sovereignty. So here, what we think about is the uh, possibility to develop a model sharing strategy, which means is, okay, we need the uh, value of this kind of if, DSI, right? But in fact, maybe, okay, so here is a maybe, maybe we don't need to share the data itself in all the uh, uh, contexts. Okay, in some contexts, we have to share data, but in other contexts, maybe we don't need to share the data itself, but we can share the model. So here, um, here is the basic idea is uh, that we develop some models, which is a basic model, maybe developed by FAO or developed by CBD. And this model is a basic model and it could be sent to a different countries who own this kind of DSI. And the, 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 each country, when they have this DSI, they can put their DSI to into this model and to this is AI model and the computing model and to run this model and to improve this model. And then the, the, this each country's model can send back. So here is the here is the idea. Here is the distributed uh, DSI utilization model. And then, then it could be sent to each country and the different country can run its close data and then make some distribution to improve the model. So here is the first step. So, um, so which, which could be used by some artificial intelligence technology like the federated learning. And uh, then the second step is when this improved model is, uh, is, uh, uh, is achieved, right? Then it could be no, okay, the uh, value, the information of each country which can contribute in this uh, uh, just like they do in the past when they share data, uh, they have to share data in one database, but in fact, it, here is the uh, distributed database and they don't need to share the database by themselves. And the second uh, value of this kind of this strategy is after each country shares their uh, model, then the CBD or the FL, the center, they could calculate the value of the DSI in each country for this model and achieve the benefit sharing principle, which means, okay, we can find, okay, maybe in country A, they, their information is more useful, more valuable for us to know the value of some important um, uh, uh, the information in this DSI. So it could be calculate more value and it could be, uh, uh, get more benefit uh, in the uh, like in the value chain. Okay, so uh, so here is uh, some uh, the uh, uh, some uh, this is what we propose this strategy. And in fact, recently we have discussed with uh, many professors, experts who are working in uh, agricultural and. Uh, uh, also no, in like in BGI and also in uh, Zhejiang University, many experts. And what we think is that they, many, many experts say, okay, I, we, we think this idea is a promising, but we still don't find a very a practical uh, way to make, to develop a pilot study to convince more people to think about this. So this, in fact, is what confused me quite a lot in the recent, uh, in the, in the, uh, 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 in so far. So I, I really think, hope that uh, I very appreciate this uh, opportunity to discuss with uh, professors, experts in today's discussion, and uh, hope that uh, it, it could be have some discussion and help us to uh, improve it and find some opportunities for a uh, cooperation. Okay, so here is what I uh, hope to uh, introduce. And uh, so thanks again. Okay, thank you.
Okay, thank you very much. That was great. And uh, we're already seeing how we can work closely together with your idea. So thank you very, very much. Uh, now I'd like to pass the baton on to Alice Hughes. Uh, Alice uh, will tell you a little bit about herself and she will chair the next session. So we won't do too much on the introduction, but we're very interested in Alice's ideas and thoughts at this time. Okay, Alice, it's all yours. Uh, thank you, Fred. So I'm just going to talk very uh, briefly on more on the concept of DSI. We've just had a great introduction to it, but many of you won't be aware of quite how important it is to the future framework. For those of you who have been following CBD discussions, you'll be aware of just how much of a fundamental impact DSI had on trying to bring the post-2020 global biodiversity framework to the next phase. Now, you will also probably not be aware that there is not yet consensus on what uh, digital sequence information actually includes. Obviously, it includes the basic information on things like species genotypes, but it can also include uh, geno uh, phenotypic information. And one of the major issues is with it is that it can also include things of, of course, commercial value. There are existing frameworks within the UN, including the International Seed uh, Treaty, as well as uh, various other treaties, which all intersect with DSI. And that means that we are now reaching a point which could be seen as an impasse, especially within the old context of access and benefit sharing. When the Nagoya Protocol was developed, it was developed in order to protect countries from basically being exploited from a capitalist perspective. Biopiracy has long been an issue. And now we've reached a point in time where accessing species genotypic data is important for their biodiversity. Having a basic understanding of genetic diversity is important. And yet DSI represents a major issue in taking things forwards. Even things like the Sea Treaty could be tied up within this. In the initial discussions on the post-2020 framework, countries like Brazil uh, showed huge levels of concern about biopiracy. Now, biopiracy, of course, is exploiting another country's uh, genetic resources for commercial aims. Within DSI, especially if you are patenting genetic information, you obviously have a huge issue with it. So this remains the major point of contention on taking the post-2020 framework to realization. Obviously, we need genetic information and um, genetic databases like GenBank are accessed more than 36 million times every year for genetic analysis. This is not a trivial issue. It also represents a huge issue in terms of how you legislate access because people need to access that data for basic analysis, for conservation. Of course, there are goals within the post-2020 framework which are linked to genetic diversity. And unless you measure genetic diversity, you cannot reach those goals. So this remains a point that we all need to find a better way to reconcile. Not only do we need better definitions of what DSI actually entails and if it's just the genetic information or it's also things like phenotypic information data on gene expression etc because those have not been finalized or agreed on centrally yet we also need to find ways to protect countries and indigenous communities so they can continue to access traditional resources without those being exploited and so we can maintain access and benefit sharing without infringing on the rights of these citizens but also provide the data we need in order to monitor and access uh, populations of bio, uh, species around the globe. So I leave it to you all to consider. This is not something we are anywhere near solving. And there are people who started talking about what an issue this would be years ago before it became the fundamental block it is now. So it's something we need to find a solution for. And it is a solution that will require a degree of compromise. We need to be creative in how we protect countries and prevent the uh, exploitation of developing countries and indigenous communities, whilst ensuring we can access the data we need to maintain genetic diversity, to not undermine treaties like the seed treaty, as well as the plant treaty and others, 
And it is a difficult balance that we are trying to find some way to move forward on. But it is something that multiple bodies are working on at the moment and that we are still probably getting further from agreement on. So it is a major access of concern. So happy to discuss further. This is nowhere near resolved yet. Thank, thank you, Alice. That that was great. And I, I think uh, what is happening is as we develop and as science develops, the complexities become even more complex. And uh, there's a guy called Richard Feynman, who you, you might know, a very famous physicist. Uh, and he would talk very much about the simplicity before complexity and the simplicity after complexity. And I think that's what we're learning, especially, and you, you underlined it beautifully in your talk, uh, to look at how do we get to the simplicity after complexity. And, and this is a very, very key thing, because otherwise we will get lost. We, we, we cannot handle 50 million. We are, we are not AI machines. We cannot handle 50 million alternatives and, and, and uh, do that competently. And, and this is one of the things. We also have expectations uh, and one of the expectations, of course, was that the uh, once you had a system, this would provide a gold mine for the developing countries, and that's probably not the case. That that it, it's a gold mine for all humanity. It's a, but it's it it may not be in your pocket or my pocket. Uh, some hard cash. So we, that, that we have to look at also the expectations. Okay, thank you very, very much. And now I would like to pass the baton on to Yang Huaming, who will uh, end up this session. And thank you very much, Alice. We'll see you soon. Mute. Uh, Fred, Fred. Good. So we still got a few questions for the speakers to answer. Okay, yeah, but all right. And we do have time, yeah. You do have time? Yeah. All right. So, so you, what? Do we want to start with the last question? Um, so traceability and prepare, um, protecting open access. Now, traceability is going to be crucially important, not just within DSI, but more globally. One of, I think, the most important uh, declarations during the IUCN meeting last year was from President Macron when he declared that France was going to become a de uh, zero deforestation importation country. At the moment, we have a system in which we impose goals all over the world. Within the IHE framework, we had the target of protecting 15% of all terrestrial areas, and we failed. One of the reasons we failed is because we seem to think that all countries have access to the resources to fulfill these targets, and that's just not the case. Developing countries want to develop. They want a better life for their citizens. They want to increase GDP, etc. And so giving them a target which might stall development is going to be massively challenging. But we need to think about where things are going. And often it's the West that is importing things. It is agriculture that is the major driver of biodiversity loss in much of the planet. And the West is importing that. So things like um, supply chain tracking are becoming increasingly important tools to help reconcile that. And we are now at a stage where you can use things like trace as well as styling verification to actually have de zero deforestation products on shelves. And you can actually assay how sustainable general commodities are for the first time in human history. This is going to fundamentally change how we operate as global societies, because it means that whilst we've talked about embodied emissions and those kinds of things in the past, we haven't talked about embodied biodiversity loss. When the West starts to take responsibility for its overseas footprint and we develop systems that enable sustainable development, that allow countries to develop in a sustainable way, and reward them for doing so, then those countries have the options of doing it. 
as long as the West is responsible for global biodiversity loss, but doesn't actually own up to that responsibility, we can't maintain biodiversity. So from a supply chain tracking perspective, it's massively important. When it comes to blockchain, blockchain is a complex issue. There are two different elements of blockchain. One of them is massively energetically expensive and will cause climate change, etc., because it requires so much energy. There are now methods which are much more efficient in terms of energy, but we need to think about what we actually need. Do we need that degree of anonymity, et cetera? And so we need to balance where we want to get to with how we want to get there. We also now live in a world of big data. We can track deforestation across the world um, almost in real time. And so using that information in a way that allows us to reach these future targets is going to be important. And that will require things like machine learning, AI, et cetera, and a suite of other types of approach. Um, We can make those anonymous. Some of it won't need to be as sophisticated as blockchain, but we do need to use that increasingly available information to give us the tools to actually enforce various mandates and legislation across the planet and make that information available to consumers. Okay. Anyone else okay. elaborate? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alice. Uh, Dashan, do you have other questions? Uh, yes. Yeah, so it was for, I think, Professor Yu. Uh, is she still here? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. So, this is an amazing model. I have watched the whole presentation, but I still got a few questions to ask. Uh, for that, you know, we have connection with both the SNI network and EBP. So what I'm asking is, if we can get our hands on the contacts with informal adversary group, how should we propose the model to them so it can make it into the final version of the global biodiversity framework? Um, okay, thanks for, for this uh, interesting question. In fact, this is also I'm uh, think about before, but so far I, I think it is not so major, uh, at, at least in my opinion, because uh, when I first proposed this model with my college, we think it could be very easy and very promising to find a pilot project to find a scenario to uh, to make it uh, could be uh, used then they then it had could convince others including uh, you, you mentioned that the uh, IG or uh, to even to that it could be used and uh, it could be used and uh, uh, not, not for all the type of data, but at least for some part of data, it is, uh, it could, it is practical. Then I think then we can find, we have the uh, convince, uh, the, uh, uh, we, we can convince others and uh, also convince the, uh, the uh, CBD for, for these institutions. Yeah, so, so then I, I uh, so at least I think this is a quite a good uh, opportunity because uh, uh, like Professor uh, Huan Ming Yang is also here. So I really uh, appreciate this opportunity to, um, to ask for uh, professors and experts uh, comments and critics on this idea because it's, I think it's a quite, uh, uh, quite new, and I only uh, see to. I, I have listened some uh, 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 some similar proposal in the uh, because I, I'm listening the uh, Geneva's uh, conference in the, in this April. In, in this in this kind of in, in this in Geneva's conference, I think one representative in India he also proposed this uh, similar idea, but I only. I only listen that uh, he, he talk about in one sentence, then just have no uh, other discussion. So I, I think um, we need to talk about with more with experts, especially like uh, Professor Famiya and other uh, experts who are working on this uh, uh, this kind of issues. So uh, so yeah, so this is uh, basically this is my uh, answer. Yeah, and I I think this is the open ended discussion. 
Thanks so much. I know that we can use a few, you know, pilot projects for models like this, but um, you know, that's story for another day. Fred, uh, there's still one last question, I think, for our suite of you, which is one of the key topics we have been talking about today, that how can we practice a system to actually protect the interests of the indigenous people and local communities, monetary and non-monetary? Because I've noticed that so far, there's no fixed definition on the ISA yet, as also a view have mentioned. So how can we protect them if we haven't given them the definition that uh, tribal knowledge matters, you know, stuff like that. So I think that answer as a question goes to all three of you. Thanks. Alice, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Okay. Do you want to have a go at that? So policy approaches, again, it's it's a really challenging balance because it's something where we need to have multilateral as well as national and international legislation that helps bridge between these. Um, I lived in Shishongbana, which is an autonomous prefecture for almost nine years at this point. And of course, you have indigenous communities that have been utilizing resources for centuries. Making sure that those communities do not lose out is critically important. And what has been seen in the past, particularly with some indigenous groups, is there has been the commercialization and patenting of products that they've been using traditionally, which then can block them from accessing resources. And this has become a major concern of many communities. So having policies that actually, are, for example, list the provenance of natural materials and make sure that even if things end up in some new drug, et cetera, that indigenous communities are recognized. We also need to consider that, especially given that some of these will be directly harvested from the wild. I mean, when we think about the seed treaty, many of these seeds are still going to be coming from wild sources. You don't want them to all be collected out. And so we need to be very intelligent in how we put those safeguards in place. As someone who does conservation research, including using genetic sequence information, like we were some of those GenBank downloads as well as uploading data last year. It is now mandated when you publish a paper that you upload the sequences in GenBank. And this is one of the reasons that makes it so complex to actually legislate on. Personally, I would like to see digitization of more resources, but I think that companies need to be made, they should not be patenting genetic information. And I think that that would also help reassure many countries that they're not going to lose access to data that actually belongs to them or products that belong to them. So putting in those kinds of safeguards that prevent the patenting of natural resources might be one step towards it as well as mandating, mandating the sharing of this information. Um, something we haven't yet really encountered that's going to become an increasing issue. We now have genomic analysis. We now have the annotation of genomes. And once we have that, it's going to open up even more challenges and opportunities. So we need to think very carefully about how this can be done in a way that can be truly seen as fair and update that access and benefit sharing framework in a way that protects people who need access to this data and basically shuts out commercialization of natural products. Because whilst the research is critically important, we and that needs funding, it's not cheap. We also need to make sure that the indigenous communities and developing countries around the world do not lose access to resources as a consequence. A uh, word before the next speaker. Do you think that CBD can regulate enterprises like this, or can the international treaty can actually have you know have a say in this, or do we have to contact with the ones doing the pat uh, patenting directly? Well, this has always been one of the challenges of all of the UN conventions is there is an overlap between them. So if you go to a meeting like the CBD, it will say, well. No, that, that goes into the international law of the sea. We shouldn't be talking about fishing outside uh, countries' exclusive economic zones and in international waters. And you'll go to a CITES meeting and they'll say, oh, no, that, that's CBD stuff. That's not CITES stuff. 
one of the challenges is that many of these conventions do have these intersections that do need to be reconciled. And at the moment, even though there has been a debate as to whether CBD looks at this, and yet we are at a point with the post-2020 framework, which we are not likely to get agreement on it until we have some reconciliation on DSI. And so even though it would be very convenient to just say, okay, we're not dealing with this, we don't have that option. Unfortunately, it's now reached a point where some countries are concerned enough that they are not going to ratify an agreement unless we have some provisions in place to protect us. So to me, what we need to do is we need to find those, talk individually to the countries that have concerns and find ways that we can reconcile those challenges. And that might be going on on a local level. There are certainly many international bodies or European wide bodies that are trying to reconcile some of this, but I don't know how inclusive they are being to the countries that have the greatest concerns. Many of which as a colonial legacy have traditionally had biopiracy issues. We need to be democratic. We need to be inclusive. We need to have better stakeholder engagement. And so we can take people with us and find agreements that truly satisfy all stakeholders. Otherwise, we're going to continue to reach more roadblocks and we cannot afford to continue to fail. Something else that also needs to be considered, and if you've sat in these negotiations as I have, what you can see is that countries like Australia and Europe look at all of these negotiations from a legalistic perspective. They will look at all of the language in this and say, is this compliant with our regulations legally? Because they see that as signatories that this is a legal document that they need to enforce. Countries in the developing world often do not have the same approach. So they will not consider it to be legally binding in their country. And the CBD is not legally binding unless a country basically makes it so, which some countries in the West have. And so if countries feel that they are disadvantaged, then they will probably just disengage from the entire CBD process. And we can't afford for those countries to disengage because they are normally the countries that have a disproportionate amount of global biodiversity. And we need to work really hard to bring them with us and to also have a better system of both rewards and sanctions so that countries have um, other incentivization to actually find ways to implement CBD visions, et cetera. Because at the moment, it's a toothless tiger, as it's called. Yeah. There is almost no way to enforce any CBD regulations. And we cannot continue to, uh, we can't afford to continue to lose biodiversity at the rates we're losing it at the moment. Thank you so much. I thought we'd leave some time for the other speakers, but yeah, Fred, <laughs> please go. Okay, okay. I guess, uh, I, I see Wang Ren has joined us. Uh, I, if you, Ren, if you would let me know if you'd like to speak, uh, that would be great. Uh, so now I will pass the uh, this chair table on to uh, Yang Huaming. Ah, thank you, thank you very much, Fred. You do have inspired the young speakers. I'm very whom I'm very proud of. That's really true that the bioethics is so important together with the biosafety to us. For, uh, I would like to say a little first comments on your talk, both of you, Heitze and Alice. Heitze, I'm really very proud of you. Not impressed by your very good English, also by your ideas. But one thing, let's think of governing. What this term in ethics means? First, I think that's the law, no doubt. Law is everything. There is no excuse to criticize the law, except you would have the opportunity to discuss how to revise the law. Then second, administrative uh, regulations. That's also important. That's what we say, that's just the second to law and more important than anything else. But all these two would be based on free discussion, first among the community of bioethics, and then more important, the public. It is easy 
it is different. It is not always the same less important. Sometimes it would become very important. That's I see the reason that a, a big and a good and intensive ethical discussion is always following the new breakthrough in science, in research, and in development of technologies. And then I'm really thinking, and Gavani, you are right. Gavani must be international. And then we have those international uh, communities or organizations. For example, I have been deeply involved in UNESCO. My something I'm really proud or a good job I really have done together with my teacher and friends is that announcement by general secretary, a director secretary of UNESCO on the free sharing of the human genome data. Now that's something maybe in between. It's not a law at all. It's non bind how to say, you may follow it, you may not follow it. But we hope you will not be against it. That's my understanding and exclamation. So here, you have stressed the uh, uh, colony. I also agree with the global colony, but the domestic discussion, also discussion just among the scientific community might be equally important. That's also a problem in China. You see how many papers you have published, I have read. How many speeches you have given, I have read. Not enough. We must create a very good atmosphere for you, the younger generation, to show up, to be more visible, to make more contributions. Because for my generation, I'm already 70 years old, what I have mainly is the past, but you have in both your brain and your hands will be the future. We really have to pay, how to say, no enough of ethics in science research. In Chinese, I say, so she has to We have to tell the people in general, science is ethical. Just like education is ethical, even both good things and bad things are done by smart people, by well-educated people. But it would not hurt our attention, our importance on education. That's a really problem for me as a professional teaching smith. If I would like to teach the people, of course, I teach them mainly, let's call the natural sciences, but he used that to do something against our principle of biosafety and biosecurity. Now, biosecurity generally means to protect the people from bioterrorists. 第二个事情呢,那是保教护航. I always think that the ethicists and the scientists or researchers are on the same boat. As I say, we have to work together in a team. We will not simply criticize or simply talking about the possible risk of any new technologies, but we would not just say half to half. No, you can see that's like a sword with two edges. And then you know which edge is sharper. It depends. The hand is in whose hand. Okay. For Alice, I really have to thank you. Now you know those like you who have a different face. And then even more, uh, even nicer, as I say, not so many. You still stay in Shisopai. Now, on one side, that is one of the most beautiful uh, places in the world and has the most or even the best and uh, good weather, the best weather. 
Well, but on the other side, for you, how many years have you been in Shishuan Pai? Now, the name it sounds beautiful. Oh, la la. Oh, no, I have really to ex uh, express my uh, full respect and full appreciation uh, to you, also on behalf of my uh, colleagues, for your contribution as a foreigner. But now you have, how does it become half foreigner? Half Chinese themselves, or half, I think you are from the United States, the, UK, uh, sorry, uh, the, the uh, United Kingdom, UK, right? No, that's very important. But now what I do, you will be invited to write more papers. You will be invited to, uh, to, to, to make more talks in the international meetings. We expect your contribution, we also expect that this is already an international community. You understand me? Because obviously everybody is deeply widely influenced by your culture because we were growing up in that environment. I have noticed what you have said. I think you do have the best sense of protecting the environment, diversity, uh, uh, <coughs> diversity, and then you have combined ethics and biodiversity. When you talk that of, about the bioethics, I can hear that you say, if we still make the biodiversity worse, it's unethical. Unethical in Chinese is a very serious word to criticize something bad. Okay, for myself, I really think that when we talk about ethicals, we always combine it with biosafety because biodiversity is also biosafety. If we still let the biodiversity, how to say, going on in that way, that would hurt our safety. That's the reason, just the following steps about the Human Genome Project, they turned ethics into ethical. You know, law is quite different from bioethics, but we put the law together. And then ethics mainly cannot be directly involved with the social issues, but we still put them together. And we turn the issue into implementations. Impli yes, in, uh, in how to say, implications, ethical. And now I add more. First, at the E, that's ecology and economy. Why economy? Now there are two things. First, the governments ask to link your research, especially basic research, and the, and the bio industry. And in many areas, in many regions, in many universities, in many research institutes, you are as a researcher, encourage you to open your own company. And then on one sense, that the criticism cannot be said wrong, that you have become stock sharer, sharers of your invention. And how to balance this one is quite different from, I have been in Boston, the US, and then in Harvard University, and then to have a company, at least is not regarded as an excellent thing. Of course, you are not forbidden from opening your company. And in, in Massachusetts Institute of Technology, you're encouraged in average, every year, a full professor would have at least three companies. And then that's really, really an issue we should be widely and fully discussed. And then we add another S, that's about safety. And then another, that's about security. That's quite different. Bio safety is just something, at least you did not do the better things. Attention, lay. And then about security, that's really very clear. It means to protect the people from biological terrorists. That's the now we have been told so much, and then we have done something, something. And that's important. Money. 
eco and the ecology. That's of course we know. And then I also have another that's education. You know, that's very, very important. Science is only a small seed. And then the people, especially the young people, would be soil. Finally, to have a tree with bamboo fruits. That's, and then I have another P. First, there's public education, or science, so called, how to say? Generalization, how to say? How to say? Scientific popularization. popularization. Yeah. And then another P is policy making. Scientists should be invited, of course, only advisors, only comments, not the policy makers themselves, but we should be involved in policy making. That's very important. And then finally, I would have a suggest, never discuss something we in uh, publicly if we ourselves don't have how to say reasonable good uh, knowledges. And then scientific education concerning scientific ethics is very sensitive. I have something. First, not to discuss it about it right now. That's the, like how to treat or deal with three girls who have already with their genome re-edited. Never turn it into a public discussion topic because now we have to protect strictly, completely the privacy, even about their names, about where they uh, uh, live and then their families. And then that's something not rather difficult for me to make the decision or make the discussion, All right? You say, no, as a scientist, we are frank about everything, but not equally or flatly. So Fred, I always, how to say, say too much until you are tired, tired with, tired off, but I'm very proud of you. Oh, definitely, you both will be invited. Alice, you have made a great contribution to the successes of ICG-16, and now 17, even 15, I think, yes, in Wuhan. I see International Conference on you know, Mix, right, in Wuhan. Oh, now, we would, I would propose or suggest you again talk about what you have talked today. Ethics. Morality, that's, that's not a different. So morality is the nature has given us something. The nature has sacrificed so much to feed the people, to make the people living. But we, we, how to say, are so bad to our nature. I think that one could be something like morality. Don't you, you think you can, can say just the ethics? I know the difference, significant difference between morality and the humanity and the ethics. And then, Fred, I know you give me 10 minutes. I say five minutes could it be surely enough. Now I will talk about them. I'm so sorry because all, always, how to say, try to share what I know with you. When I open my mind, it's so difficult for me to close. I apologize and I thank you all again to have made the full success of this panel or this panel discussion or session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you, Huami. Uh, uh, Wang Ren, are you still on? Yes. Would you join us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Uh, thank you very much. How you going? An expert from BGI. Would I give a talk? Who? Speak. Oh, who is that? Yeah. Huh? Who is it? Who is yeah. it? I cannot <laughs> see you. And I see Locus all along. One of my honorable teacher. Okay. What, what, what else should? Please, please. <laughs> uh, Fred, um, I don't know uh, who else from BGI uh, besides myself, you, and also Professor Huan Yang is joining, but uh, let me say that, uh, first of all, 
Uh, my apologies for being late in joining. I, I was involved in something else. Uh, and then uh, I uh, also would like to uh, uh, state, first of all, that the China National Gene Bank, we are very much a supporter for the open access to DSI. And I very much appreciate the uh, organization of this uh, panel and the, this uh, workshop. Um, as you all may, uh, may be familiar with, uh, BGI and also China National Gene Bank have been advocating for the open access uh, to D DSI uh, for the past uh, a few years uh, in particular. Now also, uh, many of friends know that I used to work in FAO as the Assistant uh, Director General. When I was uh, working at FAO in Rome, uh, the uh, International Treaty, the Secretariat, uh, Ken Adozi and the folks were directly, uh, used to be directly under my supervision. So Ken and I used to work uh, very hard in trying to convince more colleagues, more organizations around the world uh, to believe in uh, open access, uh, particularly on the DSI issue. And uh, after several years of uh, uh, efforts in Rome, together with the treaty secretariat, I was rather disappointed. And also I felt quite pessimistic really about the future of this open access to DSI. I felt that there were, there were too many uh, complications, too many concerns from different angles and different organizations in the countries. And also the so-called digital divide, right? Uh, the digital gap or di digital divide seems to be um, a gap really which cannot be over overpassed or overcome. And then until I came back to China and joined BGI and also with uh, the China National Gym Bank, I saw quite many opportunities where we can actually make or try to attempt to make some breakthroughs. So I see a different angle now and we have been working with um, organizations such as the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences, which has the, as you know, the uh, Agricultural Genomics Institute in Shenzhen. And we felt that at least on some practical issues and perhaps on a more narrow list of key crops, we might be able to make some difference. For instance, let me just tell you that I've been recently working and helping with uh, uh, Dr. Sanwen Huang, as you know, Huang Sanwen, the Director General of uh, Agricultural Genomics Institute at Shenzhen of CAAS, in trying to establish what he calls a global alliance on hybrid potatoes, GAPA. And the fundamental, uh, let's say, objective of that GAPA, the global alliance, is to make the, let's say the uh, uh, proprietary, uh, supposed to be proprietary technology, this hybrid potato parental lines, a public goods, that's what they intend to do. They have been in discussions with uh, the International Potato Center, SIP, in Lima, and consulting with SIP with regard to how do we deal with let's say the patent. And that patent actually derived from their studies based on what they call genome design of the parental lines. So in other words, the digital the DSI of those parental lines, which were originally obtained from SIP uh, Lima, was the foundation of the development of the hybrid potato technology. So I see some practical opportunities so what I'm trying to say is, okay, we, faced, we are faced with challenges such as described or highlighted in the call for open access, which the CBC GDF, the foundation, the fund, as well as colleagues are trying to promote, trying to advocate. Whereas on the other hand, we might be able to do something within the boundary of a nation or perhaps if we focus on some common, let's say major food crops, which might have less implications compared with wild species, let's say. 
which have been unexploited. Un okay, so I myself felt that I have been kind of a, you know, evolved from being pessimistic, being, you know, seeing a hopeless sort of debate to the current view that we should work with the colleagues such as participants to many of the participants today, you know, be optimistic, be constructive. And uh, I think like Professor Huan, Huan Ming Yang just said, if there's a will, there will be a way. <laughs> Thank you. Let me stop here. Thank you. All right. Um, I, Deshan, uh, shall we go to the, the next video? Yeah, so thank you all so much for the main presentation. And sorry that uh, Professor Yang, that we have not another speaker from BGI today, but uh, I will be showing you how should we treat the local communities because that they share valuable knowledge. And uh, this video was presented by the colleagues from the uh, Earth Biology Projects, and we thank them for that. So here goes the screen share. Uh, by the way, when this video ends, the next session will begin. So uh, Alice, you can prepare for the experts now. Thank you. Kang Chuam Guami Wakam, Kagome Chuam. Kandi Aziname Chavini Mikaniko. E Makandi Pina Chanuga the Nan. Kang Kut Nanandi Bun Kang Kut Narida Bun. Kang Kwakuma Ungegum. E Makagamri Chaywasin Vina Chanuga Nishiza Ungun. Name Kwakumana the Nan. あ、ちょいごだなんで、なんかずなめだとがちんのなんで。うん。今だまさいこかうなんで。家にきれいみなめちょちょくらんごらん。にびり。じゅわんたつこにかんなのなんで。なんでげがんごいじょなのごなん。
ni nada, sino es, es un conocimiento adquirido a través de las madres naturaleza, por lo cual eh, digo yo que no se puede comparar de un conocimiento occidental. Cuando nosotros le trabajamos al cacao es porque vemos eh, que de alguna manera no, no le afectamos mucho a la madre naturaleza, porque el cacao se puede asociar con muchos árboles. ¿sí? Nosotros no buscamos la cantidad, sino fundamentalmente conservar lo que es único, lo que es aroma y sabor, eh, porque si nosotros empezamos a inyectarles conocimientos de afuera, de afuera, como por ejemplo cuando se habla de fertilizaciones químicas, entonces automáticamente estamos eh, cambiándole el sabor que realmente las madres de naturaleza nos los regala acá en la zona. Y por lo tanto lo que tratamos es aprovecharles eh, algunos conocimientos que nos, que nos es beneficioso para nosotros dentro del cultivo de cacao. Bueno, es muy natural que que desde el conocimiento occidental le haga un seguimiento, un seguimiento de laboratorio, ¿no? porque eso no se le puede negar, porque hace parte, hace parte de las prácticas. Bueno, si hablamos de una persona que está haciendo tesis, pues es normal y no se le puede negar. Y al mismo tiempo sería muy provechoso porque de alguna manera con el tiempo nos ha de arrojar algún resultado, sean buenos o malos resultados. ¿no? ¿O quién de nosotros iba a saber que la Sierra Nevada no tiene cambio? ¿no? Y hemos logrado tener esas informaciones muy importantes a través de la investigación. ¿sí? Es, digamos, lo que convierte en tesoro nuestro producto, es que la Sierra Nevada no tiene cambio. Yo considero que nosotros no nos podemos volver ni asistencialistas ni subsidiarios. Primero, nosotros tenemos la riqueza natural, tenemos una riqueza también eh, científica porque a pesar de que nosotros no tengamos estudios certificados desde hace muchos años venimos haciendo eh, exploraciones y eso es lo que de alguna manera primitivamente luego eh, se convierte en lo que es la ciencia y lo que la gente conoce. Entonces, si nosotros permitimos el ingreso de estas instituciones, de las organizaciones, a hacer estudios, a hacer avalúos, a empezar a implementar proyectos, no es que nosotros nos vengan y nos digan, ustedes van a tener un porcentaje económico o van a tener esta retribución, eso no es lo que nosotros queremos. Lo que nosotros necesitamos es que nos brinden las herramientas para poder trabajar estos conocimientos que bien pueden ser de seguridad alimentaria, de la calidad del suelo, la calidad del agua, de cómo explotar esas otras áreas económicas que están dentro del mismo territorio y que los recursos naturales no los permiten. Si estas instituciones entran a investigar, a hacer ciencia y otras eh, pues, gestiones, etcétera, que todo ese, ese banco de información nos pertenezca a nosotros para poder luego ejercer nosotros mismos las vedurías, las gestiones, los controles y también poder dentro de nuestro ejercicio de la autonomía eh, eh, tener esa alta incidencia eh, dentro de la destinación que se le va a dar a todo eso que se haga por parte de esas entidades. Eh, primero, que se debe reconocer que nuestros conocimientos, independientemente de que no cuenten con una certificación expresa de una institución reconocida, nosotros somos un banco de información, somos un banco de experiencia y el hecho de reconocerlo va a permitir luego que ese, esos intercambios de conocimientos eh, definitivamente se complementen. Entonces, eh, una vez establecidas esas bases, eh, definitivamente, primero, brindarle las capacitaciones en los términos más prácticos dentro de su lenguaje nativo a las comunidades indígenas, a las comunidades étnicas en general, y luego eh, respetarles, garantizarles el cumplimiento de esos acuerdos. Y que, eh, lo, que re, lo que decía hace un momento, no volvernos asistencialistas, sino que estas, eh, que, como que esas, esas retribuciones que tengan verdaderamente les sirvan a ellos como herramientas para superar las capacidades que tienen actualmente, para desarrollar su sentido vocacional y para eh, definitivamente reestructurar eh, esas generaciones que luego van a servir como relevo a los mayores, a las autoridades, para que no se pierda la identidad cultural y el mensaje que en sí es proteger la madre naturaleza. Ok, thank you very much. Uh, that now ends our session. It's been really, really an exceptional, exceptional thank, uh, session. And thanks to Dachan and his, his team, it's really been a great uh, 
platform for sharing. I think we could go on for hours and uh, we'll take that into account and see what we do next. So now I'd like to pass uh, the chair of the session on to Alice, who will talk uh, to us and on a very, very important subject that was launched in the, in the, uh, in the introduction by, by uh, uh, James, uh, by, by Scanlon, Mr. Scanlon. Okay, Alice, all yours. Thank you, Fred, and thank you all for staying with us. So we've had a fantastic opening session and we've touched a lot of the topics that are pertinent to the next phase of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. In this next session, we will be talking about global wildlife trade. Um, something I found particularly interesting in John's talk is most of the time he did not say illegal trade. He said illicit trade. There is a difference between illicit and illegal trade. Um, and it is nuanced and subtle, but it's something that we do need to be aware of because the vast majority of unsustainable wildlife trade in the planet is actually legal. So I'm going to say a little bit about some of the work we've been doing about the legal but unsustainable trade in biodiversity. And then I will hand over to two other speakers who will uh, build further on that. So I'm going to share some slides with you. And as John said, this is an issue that we need to deal with. And unfortunately, whilst we are often talking about illegal wildlife trade, we tend to underappreciate other major components of global biodiversity trade, which are very problematic. A few days ago, we published a global analysis, the first global analysis for any invertebrate group on the arachnid trade, the trade in spiders and scorpions. And though I will only mention that briefly today, it's something that we all need to be aware of, that there are many drivers of biodiversity loss, which could be driving species extinct, that at the moment we are basically totally overlooking. So as I said earlier, after a decade of global biodiversity, the UN had a decade of biodiversity from 2010 to 2020, and yet we failed to achieve a single target uh, on the IEC framework. In the post-2020 framework, we need to understand why those targets failed and what we need in order to develop better targets, as well as how we are able to implement them. This is where things like stakeholder engagement are going to be critically important. But before we can tackle the problems, we need I to understand I, what they I are. Guess, uh, yep. This is going to go on, but I think okay. And yet, when we're talking about biodiversity and biodiversity loss, often we do just talk about CITES. And as John also mentioned, CITES covers a faction of species. And I, I have my own opinions on CITES. Um, it was developed, as I'll say a little more on later, for an era that no longer exists, using technology that no longer exists. And so the fact that UN bodies like UNCTAD are becoming progressively involved is important but we still have a very long way to go. So let's talk a little bit more about some of the dimensions of global biodiversity trade. So the photos you see at the bottom are actually me. There is a 20 year difference between those two photos. That's with my pet snake, Benjamin. In the West, there has been this explosion of popularity for exotic pets. And yet when you go into a store to buy a lizard or a tarantula, there is this assumption that that animal was probably bred in that town and that it's been bred in a completely sustainable way, maybe several generations. And the reality is that for almost every group that we've examined, the majority of animals are still coming directly from the wild with considerable mortality attached to them. And most of the public are unaware of the fact that the pet trade is still a major driver of global biodiversity loss. And we've seen an explosion across groups. It's very important to note, and I will say more on this later, that access and benefit sharing has many connotations. So does sustainable livelihoods. One of those is that countries are meant to profit from their biodiversity. And one of the most direct ways of doing that is through the pet trade, as well as other forms of wildlife trade. 
But the reality is that when we talk about sustainable trade, often we lack any data to show that it's sustainable. The EU has an EU bird directive and the US has a US bird act. Both of these prevent the importation of wild caught birds. When they were initially introduced, there were so-called conservationists who pushed back and said, this contravenes access and benefit sharing. These countries have the right to sustainable livelihoods. Thankfully, those so-called conservationists, and I say so-called because I, I don't view them as conservationists. What they do is very much undermining conservation. The results of those bans are estimated to have caused the decrease in global trade of wild birds by around 90%. Whilst trade remains problematic in areas like Asia, where the Asian songbird trade continues to drive species extinct, making the majority of wild caught bird trade illegal means that that wild caught trade has largely been replaced by captive breeding, reducing the risk of disease spread, which is significant with wild caught animals, and also reducing the pressure on wild populations. There is absolutely no doubt that for the majority of species, by reducing the amount of wild caught trade, we could better conserve them. And yet at the moment, there is this argument within the conservation community by people who are in some cases funded by trade, that trade is something that should be allowed even without good data on the impact on wild populations. And as you'll see in a moment, we do not have the data for the majority of species in trade. The global aquaria trade, for example, is known to have major impacts on tropical fish. The US alone imports about 2,300 species. Now, the good news is that for freshwater fish, now most of those that are in the aquaria trade are bred in captivity. Unfortunately, saltwater aquaria are difficult. And whilst there is a growing demand for saltwater aquaria, most of those fish are still coming direct from coral reefs. Another problem is that if you were to go to the US where they have lemmis, um, and Lemis is actually a body that basically tracks the imports of all wildlife into the US. It does not actually list groups like what species of tropical fish. It just says tropical fish. And so for many of these species, we lack any data on the quantities that are being imported. And if we don't know how much we're importing, we cannot gauge what impact it's having on wild populations. Reptiles are particularly popular pets, but only 9% of or species are actually within CITES. For amphibians, it's worse at about 2.4%, and for invertebrates, it's vanishingly small. Also, as we saw in our recent arachnid analysis, uh, it's under 2% of species of arachnid in trade are listed by CITES. So 98% of arachnids that are being traded have no CITES assessment. Most of them are also unassessed by the IUCN. So anyone who tells you, well, it's fine to trade these animals because it's sustainable, we do not have enough data to assay the impacts. What we do know is that for at least 21 species of amphibian, the entire wild population is assumed to have been collected out for pet trade. And so there is no doubt that this is impacting on them. On other monitored populations where people did an assessment of populations in areas where it was known that uh, collection was taking place versus areas where no collection was taking place. It was found that trade and collection was impacting negatively on wild populations in around 68% of cases. So there is no doubt that this is driving species towards extinction. And yet for the majority of species, there is no monitoring or legislation to protect them. And to just underscore the popularity of this trade, there is some analysis that suggests that reptiles are actually more popular pets than dogs in the UK. This is in part because many people who have reptiles or invertebrates indeed will have multiple individuals. In our recent analysis of arachnid trade, we saw discussions online when single individuals would have more than 200 species of arachnid because there is this drive to trade and to try to get the rarest species possible as well as to collect as many as possible. And this is hugely problematic for species which are often endemic. So when we looked at the global reptile trade, we found almost 4,000 species of reptile were in trade, including over 200 species that were critically endangered or endangered, and literally hundreds of species that were vulnerable. 
we also found over 100 species that were data deficient. Similar patterns existed for the amphibians and for the invertebrates, for the arachnids, it was even worse because the majority have no CITES level assessment. And for the invertebrates, the arachnids, there were around 1,300 species that were in trade. If we were to look at the species that have been recently described, for the reptiles, we found about 133 species that have been described since 2000 and are already in trade. For the amphibians, it was around 40 species. And for the arachnids, it was around 200 species in total. But there were a further 100 species that were being traded under a colloquial name that have not been formally described, but where the genus name was associated with a color or locality, highlighting the fact that it is probably an undescribed species in trade. We have documented examples where species were illicitly exported and described from those illicitly collected individuals. So there is no doubt that this represents a major problem. Furthermore, many of these species have no scientific assessment. We do not know what their population is in the world, but we can gauge that for recently described species, they are likely to be range endemic. Indeed, in the invertebrate species, we found the arachnids around 75% of species were in one country. And for 95% of species, they were in less than five countries, meaning that indiscriminate collection within countries could have a huge impact on the future survival of those species. For the reptiles, we found that nine species were in trade in the year that they were scientifically described. And given that they have no default protection, they can be legally traded even before any form of conservation assessment has taken place. There is no control on how many individuals are being exported. And as I said earlier, for amphibians, over 21 species are known to have had their entire wild populations collected for trade. If we look at the level of regulations, so this is looking across the world, we can see that looking at the blue, the majority of species of reptile in pretty much all country are not in trade. And yet if we look at species that are in trade, the majority of species that are in trade shown in the red here have no conservation assessment or are, are basically have no CITES level protection. The only countries that protect the majority of their traded reptiles are Madagascar and New Zealand. And if we are to look at the proportions of species that are threatened or data deficient, what we can see is that for Asia, the majority of species are either threatened or data deficient. And for the whole of the African continent, the majority of species that are in trade are data deficient, meaning that we have so little data in these species that we are exporting with no quotas that we can't even assay their conservation um, threat status. What we can also do is look at the percentage of these species that are wild caught. So around 40% of reptile trades are from wild caught individuals. This was over 75% in the lizards though. So for certain packs, we see the vast majority of species are coming from directly from the wild. For the arachnids, it was about 70% overall, but up to 99% for some families are coming directly from the wild meaning that there is absolutely no doubt that this is harming the survival of these species. And so when we look at the data, what we can see clearly is that trade is having a massive impact on these species. And yet the majority of this trade is legal. In fact, in all of these cases, less than 0.01% of this was from seized data and 99.99% of amphibians and reptiles in trade were being legally traded whereas 0.003% of arachnids in trade were from seizure data, with all other animals being legally traded. What we also need to be aware of is if we look at the rates of species description in these groups, they are increasing. This is the rate of species being described versus um, the year, and this is their average range size. As we describe new species, we find that they have a progressively smaller range, and yet there is a joke that when a new species of reptile is described in Myanmar, two Germans get on a plane with empty suitcases because there is such a thirst for newly described species. And given that these species are completely unprotected, it means that these small range species are vulnerable to having their whole collections, uh, their whole world populations in trade before any form of conservation measure can be put in place to protect them. What we can also see is that the percentage of species coming from the wild 
varies radically in different groups. The red bar here shows the number of individuals that are coming from the wild. So what we can see is, as I said, just under 75% of lizards are coming directly from the wild and they're in trade. And only the crocodiles have the majority of species in trade coming from captive bred or ranched populations, meaning that for other groups, we could be having a disproportionate impact on their wild populations. We can also, to a degree, map out species that are in trade. So if we were to map out species of amphibians and reptiles that are impacted by trade, we can see that across the tropics, the majority of species are in trade. And in fact, when we analyze the percentage of species in trade, we find that almost all areas have around half or more of their known species are actually being traded, often for the pet trade, but as I'll say more on on the next slide, for some other uses as well. What we also need to be aware of is that if we look at this bottom panel here, the CITES trade, CITES is the body that is meant to prevent the unsustainable export of wildlife. And yet the CITES data for these neglected groups is so poor that you can't even understand the basic patterns of trade. If we were to map out the endangered and data deficient species in trade, we would find that Southeast Asia stands out as a hotspot of threatened species that are legally being traded, highlighting the need for enhanced protection for species in this region and the fact that we need a fundamentally new approach to prevent the unsustainable trade of these species into the future. What we can also do is look at the percentage of threatened species in trade and where they are coming from for these different groups. And for both the amphibians and the reptiles, we find the majority of threatened species are coming from Asia with some hotspots across other parts of the planet. What we can also do is map out why they are being traded. Because of course, different types of trade are going to be in different volumes and require different types of legislation to prevent. What we can see is that pet trade is a major driver of trade, but we also have medicinal trade, particularly in Southeast Asia, and we also have trade for meat coming from Asia, as well as parts of the Amazon and Africa. Better measures are needed to control this. And there is also, of course, the disease relation between many of these species, given that poor biosafety conditions can mean that the trade of wildlife can also indiscriminately spread diseases, as well as parasites into regions, which can have a huge impact on the future survival of these species with chytrid fungus and amphibians known to have caused the extinction of species from the mid 1980s as a consequence of the trade of Xenopus and other amphibians. And we know that today that the trade of bullfrogs is causing a continued spread of ranavirus and chytrid fungus to vulnerable populations of wild uh, amphibian across the planet. CITES is also full of issues. This was mentioned by John earlier, but given that we have the CITES meeting later this year, it is something that we all need to be aware of. Unfortunately, CITES is no longer fit for the purpose that it was originally designed for. Not only does it still work on a paper-based system, but in cases where it has been examined in detail, we find that under 7% um, of records are actually free of major issues. In fact, the uh, level of discrepancies are so high that only 7.3% of all records in some analysis were found to be free of discrepancies, meaning that this data, this cornerstone of global analysis on wildlife trade is so full of issues that we cannot use it to track trade, even for the small proportion of species that it actually covers. So whilst ecologists tend to think of CITES as a wildlife convention, as John said earlier, it is a trade convention, and we cannot forget that. But we need to use UN conventions better to ensure that they adequately protect species. We also need to remember that within CITES, some of the most active parties are bodies that are looking at game. They are looking at how we can commodify wildlife, and we need to find better ways to ensure that it does not fail to protect the wildlife that we think of it as designed to protect. It's also true that recent declarations to try to uplist Asian songbirds, which are targeted for the Asian songbird trade, as well as tropical fish, were viewed as too expensive. And whilst ITIS and Mike, which both focus on elephants, have core funding from CITES, 
funding was not made available from central CITES funding to do the basic assessments needed for these groups. We also need to remember that there is a fundamental imbalance in the CITES profits, which are about $320 billion a year, relative to a CITES budget of around 6 million annually, meaning that they do not have the funds to do the assessments that they need, as well as to use new technologies to actually monitor trade effectively. As I said earlier, LEMIS, which is the US Fish and Wildlife Service's way of tracking imported wildlife, is currently the best way of tracking imported wildlife around the world, despite the fact that it only applies to one country and it fails to monitor certain groups like Lepidoptera and tropical fish. Other groups like the TRACES program in Europe monitor a subset of species because of the disease risk, but these fail to provide species level data needed to monitor trade and non cites species simply cannot be monitored based on any existing database. So we need to do a lot better. Despite pushing for better inclusion for almost a decade, many of these groups are still completely undatabased, meaning that for the majority of species in trade, we cannot gauge the impact of trade on their populations. CITES coverage is also hugely uneven, as I stated earlier. And orchids are actually the most covered group, making up about 70% of all CITES records. And yet, if you talk to any orchid researcher, they will tell you that CITES is a nightmare and it is not fit for purpose when it comes to trading plants. So within CITES, species are not being adequately protected or monitored in most cases. For the arachnids, there are only 30 species that are currently monitored by CITES, and for none of them is it adequately enforced to have any level of monitoring, meaning that millions of things like emperor scorpions, the emperor scorpion being the only scorpion listed within CITES, are traded, with the majority still coming from the wild, despite no population level data from wild sources. So I've said some of this already, and we have a couple of exciting speakers ahead, so I would like to go faster. So we need to do a lot better to conserve species. At present, disease has been the primary driver for listing species with measures like the zero import within Europe of wild caught birds, and we need to do better across groups. Australia actually suggested a reverse listing approach in 1985, where species would need an assessment in order to trade them. And yet we are still not there despite the fact that trade is undoubtedly driving species ever closer to extinction. We now have better tools than we could have imagined when CITES came into force. So we need to utilize those to better track trade and ensure that we don't continue to trade species potentially towards extinction. Mortality is also high during transport, meaning that we have no data on the level of trade for many of these groups. And we need to make sure that we actually protect species rather than trading them until we know that they are already on the brink of extinction. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening. And then I will hand over to my next speaker, who in this session is Winnie Kiru, who will tell us more about the trade and protection of African elephants. And we will save all questions to the end of this session so that they can be put to all of the speakers. So Winnie, if you would like to share your screen and tell us more about African elephants. Hello, how are you everyone? Hello, can you hear me? Very clear, thank you. Right, thank yeah, you very please much. Please go ahead and share your screen when you're ready or just talk. Okay. Is your I'm, I'm just going to talk. You're going to just have to see elephants in my screen, say, in, my, in my background. Um, thank you very much, Alice. That has been such a fascinating uh, uh, talk because I worked on the illegal, on the pet trade for some time, about 10 years ago. And as an African person who had absolutely no view of what it meant for a person in San Francisco to want to own lizards or, or snakes, I was completely blown away. In Africa, people basically have a very healthy respect for some of these reptiles and, and, and spiders. And to see people actually craving to have this as exotic pets for me was 
absolutely fascinating. When I started to learn about the numbers, just the sheer quantities of, of animals in trade, some that nobody even knew existed, and the level of ignorance in my own country of just how big this trade was, the, the fact that the people manning, for instance, airports, just had no idea that people would carry huge amounts of snakes and spiders with no permits, no, no license, nothing. And they did not understand that this was a trade that was happening. To me, it was mind blowing just to see how much of Africa's resources get into trade without any, any view from us as African people. So thank you very much for, again, bringing that context into play that the question of trade is actually very little, very, very ill understood. So first of all, colleagues, I just want to wish you a, a happy World Biodiversity Day. Even though there are many grim uh, um, you know, statistics that we can all share, we are still lucky that the world still has some, a large variety of living things on earth. And I want to thank the China Biodiversity Conservation and Green Development Foundation for this invitation to talk about this very important um, issues that unite us around the world as we think about all these living things on earth. Of course, we can all agree that uh, the environmental crisis facing our planet has never appeared so serious. In Africa, you know, rapid population growth, habitat destruction, climate change, just overexploitation, both in the legal and illegal trade, are very important drivers of this crisis. Uh, wildlife population declines and species extinctions are occurring at unprecedented levels. In fact, it is so sad that we are losing stuff that we don't even know exists. And we have seen, even from the global assessment reports, you know, it this shows us that a million species face extinction. I, I mean, the figures are actually mind blowing. And uh, the assertion that human activities threaten more species now, more than ever before, means that we really have to introspect as, a, as people, like what is it? that we can do differently. So my name is Winnie Kiru. I am a Kenyan-based biologist. I spend most of my life studying elephant conservation and management, uh, very inclined towards looking at the interaction between people and elephants. I am here wearing several hats. The Elephant Protection Initiative is probably one of the initiatives I would like to speak about and the role of this initiative in bringing together African countries. 21 African countries signed up to the Elephant Protection Initiative between 2014 and, and, and say two or three years ago, we got to our 21st member, that which was Benin. And basically what the initiative was put together to do was to look at elephant protection. And at the time when the initiative came into play, the biggest issue was really ivory trade because at that time, the statistics and the, the flows of ivory from Africa to Asia and really Europe and America was starting to be really alarming. Huge amounts of uh, ivory were being seized in ports around, you know, in Hong Kong, in, in, in Singapore, Malaysia. And, and it was very alarming. Of course, it was also obvious to those of us on the ground that the level of illegal killing of elephants had also reached levels that were completely alarming. So the initiative uh, focused on bringing high level political engagement in the protection of elephants. The initiative really focused on the idea that unless we engage heads of state, government ministers in this conversation, we, we were not going to change much as technical people constantly working 
on the ground and collecting data and going to CITES and making these arguments unless the highest level of political players within Africa were actually aware and committed to making a difference. So the initiative brought together was actually signed by heads of state. Um, and the first countries that signed on to this one initiatives were actually quite interesting because they brought together the range really of African governments from different parts of Africa. So from Southern Africa, we had Botswana, we had Tanzania in East Africa, we had Chad uh, from the West African region, we had Ethiopia sign on to the initiative and Gabon. And all this were represented by their heads of state in the Illegal Wildlife Trade Conference in London. Now, um, what was the gist of this declaration? It was really just an appreciation that the illegal ivory trade was uh, having an unproportionate impact on the survival of elephants on the continent. And so a moratorium against this trade was important in principle so that we would focus on conserving elephants and ensuring that trade is not one of the issues driving um, the extinction of our elephants. Just have a moratorium for about 10 years so that we can really focus on e other issues like human elephant conflict and space, you know, uh, spatial planning for elephants. As you all know, all these declarations on paper become extremely challenging to implement once you go back to actual country um, policies and legislation. And the competing interests in many of our African countries make it extremely difficult to implement even those um, treaties that are signed on with great commitment. Now, I must say that despite all the challenges, we have had some incredible success with this group of leaders. I would say one of the things that they have done very well is to increase African voices at high level in terms of communicating to the world the challenges of the illegal ivory trade. And indeed, we have had, we had many instances when heads of state from Gabon, from Tanzania, from Kenya, who eventually joined the, 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 the Elephant Protection Initiative, made very strong statements that really changed the way people looked at the ivory trade. And I must say some of the impacts of those statements coming from such high level was that it gave the impetus of countries that were probably disproportionately um, active in consumption of ivory to make very bold decisions. So for instance, China made the bold decision to start to close its ivory, the domestic ivory market. And I believe that some of these um, very bold decisions were made because the African voices that were speaking against the trade were really at very high level. And we saw the same decisions being made by countries like the United States. And it's in fact, the European Union has done, has made great strides towards closing the ivory market, the UK. Now with the closure of this market, it meant that because we constantly said the moment the buying stops, the killing will stop. And what we are seeing now after the 2014 declaration to date, we have really seen the ivory trade dying. The prices of ivory now, even if some um, would put them at very high black market prices, we believe that with the closure of this market, ivory is no longer a big issue on the table because the price of ivory is very low. The demand for ivory is incredibly low. And we are seeing this translated in African countries in terms of what their priorities are now. Because when I think about a country like Kenya, in the last three or four years, we have lost more elephants to human elephant conflict 
and the impacts of climate change than poaching. Just in the last nine months, we have lost 78 elephants to drought related mortality. This are uh, the prolonged droughts, as we know, are impacts of climate change. And of course, exacerbated by the environmental crisis where uh, with the expanding human populations, land management has become increasingly poor. And it, I hope that this decade of environmental restoration will actually help to focus on some of those issues around land degradation, invasive species, habitat destruction, whether to relate this to climate change or even just the way government policies translate, I think these issues are important. I will just say that from what we have seen in the last few years, clearly focusing on high level uh, in interaction in these issues has a net positive impact because it gives courage to those that need to make important policy decisions, it gives them the courage to make really very decisions that could have very high political costs because they can see their counterparts also making important statements and showing a real interest in these issues. And I would actually urge that that strategy be adopted even in discussions like what I was listening to um, the, the DSI discussions, how much does my president know about these issues? How much does the president of Gabon know about what discussions are going on in, in, in CBD? How many statements can he make at the United Nations General Assembly? What does it mean? What, how can you make important policy and legislative changes in countries when the heads of states and governments do not understand the real impact of what is going on and how it's impacting their people. It's very important to raise these discussions to very high level because even if you will only get five minutes of presidential face-to-face, um, -face, those five minutes can make a significant change in the way these issues are articulated globally. And I don't just mean articulations in speeches, I mean taking the time to explain and to ensure that the understanding of some of these issues that we are talking about is actually very clear. And you don't need every head of state and government to understand, you need a critical number. This is what we learned at the Elephant Protection Initiative. Now, of course, the trade in wildlife species is big business, both the legal and illegal trade. The illegal trade is estimated to be worth up to $20 billion every year. And these figures are said to be rising. According to CITES, the trade in what is so so called sighted species over 421 million individuals of threatened wild animals were traded across borders just between 1998 and 2018 that's just two decades now if these are the numbers we are dealing with then we need to escalate these issues to the level at which bold decisions can be made, decisions that will make a real difference in the way these issues are faced. And with that, for us in the Elephant Protection Initiative, now we have seen a need to change or to adopt another strategy, given that the 10 years in which we worked in illegal wildlife trade or wild ivory trade, we, we really were able to see the success in bringing or escalating the voices to very high level. We have now developed a strategy to start looking at an issue that is really changing the way people and wildlife are interacting. And this is human wildlife conflict. Our next 10 year strategy is focusing on human 
elephant conflict. And we will take the same route. We are going to ensure that high level African voices are being heard on human elephant conflict so that it is moved from an issue that is communicated as a simple local problem. Because a lot of times the issue of human elephant conflict is diminished by saying, oh, it's just people are too many. What you need to do is give them birth control. When they reduce, the, this problem is going to end. No, that is not true. People have lived with wildlife for years. African people have been the protectors of wildlife resources. I think that we, it is clear that wildlife would not have survived for all these years if there was not an intricate relationship between the people and the wildlife. The story of the people living with wildlife is not one of conflict, it's a story of coexistence. And so there must be certain things that have changed dramatically that have now escalated the conflict so that the story of conflict is being heard more than the story of coexistence. What are those things during the COVID disruption? This is what we saw. The restriction of movement of people between national boundaries and also international boundaries was an interesting view for us to be able to see, would it actually result in an elevated threat to wildlife? Because now the local people had um, unbridled access to these wildlife resources. Even national wildlife authorities could not function because of reduced funding and restrictions on operations of a lot of these conservation agencies. The illegal wildlife trade chain was totally disrupted because of restrictions, both of air transport and road transport. The disruption of supply chains also became a serious problem. And of course, the reduced funding for conservation. What did the people do? The local people who live with wildlife, did they now go on the rampage? Did they go out and kill elephants to feed themselves? Did they go out to kill every antelope in town to feed themselves? That's not what they did. In actual fact, in the area where I work in Amboseli National Park, the wildlife was literally in celebration mode. For the first time in, since 1997, we saw two female elephants give birth to twins. And these twins became a serious attraction, both for the local people and also for you know, the Kenyan people. They would come to Amboseli to see these twins because it is not common for elephants to have twins. And most importantly, they had them during COVID, a time when there was no tourism in the parks. Yes, there was less money. People were stressed because they didn't have the economic activities that they usually do. But it also meant that there was more space for these animals. There was a lot more um, ability for them to travel around and find food. I'm glad to report that one of the pairs of twins is still thriving. Uh, unfortunately, we lost one of the males um, in, in about five months ago because the drought has really been biting and it's difficult for elephant um, mothers to look after twins. What am I saying? the story of conflict between people and wildlife is one that has been created by decisions made and not made. And some of these decisions operate at a very high level. Spatial planning cannot happen at local level. Spatial planning has a huge political cost. It needs to be in policy and legislation, but it also sits, needs to sit right in the heart of minds of our political leadership. Spatial planning is probably one of the in, most important solutions to human elephant conflict. Rural poverty cannot be resolved 
in any other way except bold political decisions which change the way the rural economies are translated. I will end my conversation by saying this. We have serious challenges and indeed the solutions seem far away from us, but there are things that have been tried and tested and they've worked. And for us, we see the engagement of high level political will in some of these discussions, which engage us so much, especially as scientists, as practitioners, sometimes we need to speak to the unlikely. We need to stop preaching to the choir. We need to stop just talking to ourselves and to each other. We need to escalate these decisions to those that can afford to pay the political cost. Thank you very much. Thank you, Winnie, for sharing your enlightening thoughts and perspectives with us. Those are some really important points to consider. And many people don't understand the degree of nuance that we see in some of these systems and that we really do need to have a better understanding of. So we'll save questions to the end and hopefully we'll have a fantastic discussion then. Um, but for now, we're going to have a presentation. Sheldon is not here at the moment, but uh, Zhang Jiaqin will do the presentation on Sheldon's behalf. So if you would like to go ahead, Jiaqin. Yep. So sorry for the disruption. I think Mr. Sir Sheldon Jordan has been hold up with something because he sent us the whole package of PPT and what was to work script and didn't come. So I will do his honor and share some share some uh, informative messages about wildlife trading. So good evening, everyone. My name is Sheldon Jordan, and I'm present today on illegal wildlife trade from a practitioner's point. So to give you a little bit of background about myself, I was Director General of Wildlife Enforcement uh, for the Government of Canada for the last 12 years. And I'm currently planning on my next venture. I have worked with many international, domestic, and indigenous organizations. And I'm privileged to have seen people such as yourselves who are passionate about our shared environment. I would like to thank China Biologist Conservation and Green Young Foundation for inviting me to speak alongside with other amazing panelists here today. And I'm here to thank you for organizing such interesting and broad events over the next two days to celebrate International Day for Biological Diversity. So when we look at it, sorry, strong sustainable biodiversity is in our common goal. The challenge is that criminals undermine that goal. Crime takes away from the progress that we are making while at the same time earning money from committing it. So countries and global communities are trying to make sure that we have structures in place to prevent and stop crime. And today I'd like to speak for things. The first one is context. What is wildlife trade and what is illegal wildlife trade? The second is to look at what enforcement models exist. We need, to, we need strategies to win the war on crime. Third, it is important for civil society organizations such as yours to be aware of what the frameworks are and that and whether it will help or hinder us from fighting wildlife crime. And when I talk about tools, I'm talking about technology. I'm thinking of laws and mechanisms for collaborating, which are also important. And fourth, what can be done? There is no problem that does, does not have a solution, and this one has many solutions. Moving on to the second slide. One of the big things many people around the world think when we talk about wildlife crime is exotic species. We think of elephants, we think of panda, we think of pangolins, but wildlife and wildlife trade is much more than that. If you look at wildlife trade over the last two decades, it's pretty much tripled in terms of value. And it isn't the elephants and the pandas that are driving this. The value of legal trade is really driven by consumable life, wildlife, such as uh, fish, timber, and other indigestibles, such as medicines. Uh, sorry, the internet lagged out for a little bit. Uh, where, where was I, Alice? 
Um, you were to, you just mentioned medicines. Okay, okay. Uh, at the same time, there has been a very big increase of illegal wildlife trade since the mid twenties, as as most of you are aware, with poaching crisis in mobile elephants, rhinoceros, sharks, and bears. However, the biggest part of wildlife crime is actually a little hard to see. Consumable goods that they eat or build furniture from has a much greater impact on biodiversity than removing singular animals from an ecosystem. It is taking in a criminal manner large chunks of ecosystem and turning them into illegal products. So moving on, if you look at the illegal wildlife trade, we first have to look at it as a proportion of wildlife trade. Wildlife and wildlife products include animal, plants, fish, and timber is legal to trade. We are all dependent on legal wildlife trade. If you are writing a piece of paper that is wildlife because it came from a tree which came from a forest. If you had fish for supper, it's probably caught somewhere on the ocean. And with a rapid increase in the legal wildlife trade over the last 20 years, there has been also been a significant increase in illegal ones. So if we look at this graph on the right, the uh, wait a minute. Oh uh, yeah, this is one. Uh, all the wildlife trade works up to about one trillion US dollars per year. Uh, to put that in per perspective, the illegal drug trade was less than a third of that. Now, looking at the red orange section, one quarter of the overall wildlife trade is illegal. Works up to $227 billion more or less per year. Now, if you look towards that, the very small part in gray at the top of the graph, that is actually where the enforcement agencies and the regulators around the world are spending most of their time. That is the estimated illegal trade for CITES, regulated species. Uh, so basically, looking at the trade and the wildlife together, it makes up the big circle. But where global enforcement efforts is on the what is its on the smaller proportion? Because the site is regulated trade, and that is one, the easiest to enforce. Because it's regulated, meaning there's paperwork and docu documentation and declarations. And two, because no one wants to see endangered species go extinct. And while that is not bad, we need to recognize that we are putting both policy and enforcement efforts into a very small proportion of overall wildlife crime. The collateral impact of focusing on such one area is that it puts in danger other parts of the wildlife biodiversity that is not registered in trade or represents a much larger value. So moving on, we just see how important wildlife trade is and how big the wildlife crime is. So how do we fight it? Well, there are essentially two models that we use in the world, and each has strengths and each one has challenges. The first model on the left which is most common is usually a combination of police and costume enforcing wildlife laws. This is used in most countries where police will enforce wildlife laws inside the country and custom will enforce them on the border. It has many advantages. For example, the fact that you have police and costume means that they are enforcement organizations. They sing, they breathe, they get up in the morning to do enforcement and they are well resourced for enforcement. They are also linked to specialists. So for example, if you have a financial crime, if you need fingerprinting, these are all very much readily available. However, when we are looking at environmental crime, police and customs have a tendency to deprioritize it. Instead of putting their forces on crime against human, like violence or property, there are a lot less costs for prioritizing environmental crime. And as such, at least that's not really specializing it. And this is an area that requires specialization. Also, people in the police organization tend to move on rather quickly and they don't create a lot of long-term specialization or continuity. The other, the other model is what we have in Canada and North America, a specialized enforcement authority that is what I manage for a number of years. Here, officers and managers have significant continuity. They will spend half or even all their career in one organization specializing in one area. However, a challenge is that while they enforce laws, they usually work for a regulatory or scientific organization, which looks at illegal trade 
as a conservation and not a crime matter. Also, they do not have as easy access to crime specialists. So once again, going back to fingerprinting and financial crime, the specialized enforcement authority can be a little silo cut off from others. So what we see that is there's no perfect model, but we do see that there is greater need for communication and for cross coordination between regulators, scientists and enforcers, no matter what model is used. Moving on. Why do we need better links and communication among officials? Because the wildlife crime does exist on its own. This chart from a colleague of mine, which shows wildlife crime on the left, ivory, shark, rhinosaurus, and then look at the right. Human celebrity type of crime. This illustrates a study of the linkage between people committing wildlife crime and people involved in human trafficking and exploitation. What you see is that there's a lot of people who are involved in wildlife. Rhino, Pangolin, and Bano, who are also involved in human trafficking, forced labor, especially the fishery industry, sexual exploitation. There was a report that came about five months ago about sexual exploitation around the wildlife crime, fish for sex. So the challenge here is that wildlife crime does not exist on its own. It is very much linked up with other kinds of crimes. So we need people and organizations who can fight many different kinds of crime at the same time. That requires cooperation across domestic organizations and across borders. So what are the tools that we have to work with? Most of you are probably familiar with CITES already, and this is a great starting point for looking at wildlife crime. However, it really only focuses on a certain number of species, as John has mentioned before. And it focuses on the trade, it doesn't focus on the crime. Each party or country is responsible for creating its own laws and penalties for infractions involving scientists these species. So remember the wildlife trade graph is a little great proportion on the top. This is it. That is what we have global wildlife trade regulations on. So it is of limited use in terms of taking on wildlife crime. CBD, well, that has a policy focus. It is really talking about implementing high level changes to policies, to programs encouraging biodiversity. For example, creating protected areas as such. But it does not create any infra infraction, so it's not enforceable. Continuing along, we have regional fisheries management organizations in many parts of the world, but once again, those manage harvesting quotas. Well, sometimes these create limits. You, excesses usually result in trade sanctions uh, against the country and not against an individual perpetrator. So, a moment. I think the real charge is here. Uh, uh, Mr. Sheldon Jordan, can you hear me? Is it kind of awkward? Uh, I can hear you. Ah. Uh, it says here that he had a big storm yesterday and I just got electricity back. So I think I will do the honor and finish the rest of the presentation and see if Mr. Sheldon can join with us for the discussion. <laughs> Much apologies. I will, I will keep on doing the presentation. Hello? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry I'm so late. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. I, I, we took the liberty and I have done about half of the presentation already, if you don't mind. I was... Well, I'm very pleased that I made a, 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 a script for this. Thank you so much. You, you are most welcome to join the roundtable discussion while I have the honor to do the job, okay? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I think that we are on to... Finally, there is the UN Convention on Corruption, uh, which is a very important thing because all the environmental crime is done for money and a lot of the money that is generated, which goes to feed corruption. If you look at illegal forestry, you are looking at corruption to a large extent. Why? 
because someone is trying to take something illegal and enter it into the legal value chain. It's usually something whether you had to pay an official to look, look the other way when you were selling illegal cut wood, or to look the other way when taking more wood or taking more harvest area than you are originally permitted. And we all can imagine the damage that that, that does to biodiversity. But once again, this legal tool is looking at corruption bodily and not as a facade of wildlife crime. So what can we do about wildlife crime? Uh, this report uh, coming from the CBD meetings in Geneva in March really need to be looked at seriously. First is the strategy. This framework around biodiversity has to have a whole of government and a whole of society approach. That means that wildlife and biodiversity cannot just be handled by resource department or the environmental departments. It needs to be integrated into all aspects of national and subnational policy. And how do you do this? Well, number two is the political will and the recognition that needs, this needs to be done. It is through convincing and encouraging our leaders to make this a priority that we are going to be able to get a hold of government approaches. Finally, when it comes down to fighting the environmental crime aspects, what we need is well functioning judicial and enforcement system. That means that each country and the global community need to have the appropriate legal framework in place. You need to have rule of law and you need to be able to have integrity in terms of ensuring and, uh, that compliance and non-compliance are dealt with appropriately and transparently. People need to see the law being applied fairly and predictably to have trust in it. So let's took, at, took a look at what can be done. First, in each country and then globally. As I mentioned, all of the government's approach means that we need to look beyond just crime fighting and the environment with domestic regulations. We need to include wildlife, illegal wildlife trade into things such as foreign development, education, capacity building, and compliance promotion. We need to look at this notice, not as an animal environmental issue, but as a crime and justice issue. Because what is happening is that crime is undermining our global efforts towards achieving and sustaining the biodiversity that we all depend on. Secondly, sorry. Secondly, most countries have laws implementing the CITES Convention and that it's great for the species that are covered by it. However, there are lots more species elements that are illegal wildlife trade that are not studied species, as the speakers has mentioned before. So we need, as Canada has done, and all laws importation of any wildlife that was taken or transported illegally into another country, whether it is cited related or not. As well, I mentioned earlier, there's always more collaboration that needs to be done. Regulatory, scientific, educational, and enforcement authorities. We need to bring people together to share the knowledge, to strategize and to implement together. Finally, leadership. For people and agencies, that means the organizations that are responsible for environmental law enforcement, whether it be police or costume or specialized organizations, they need to be leaders. They need to lead their countries, they need to participate in global efforts, such as Interpol's environmental crime working groups and in regional wildlife enforcement networks, because the illegal wildlife trade is transnational crime that requires transnational responses. We need more countries to provide transnational compliance and enforcement leaders. And finally, you need continuity, as I mentioned already. Often police or costume agencies will have someone in the wildlife crime role for one to three years. That simply is not enough time to gain the expertise and experience. We need people and leaders to be in those roles for a significant period of time. For example, when they are doing wrestling internationally, it needs to be for a period of at least five to 10 years to create the trust that they needed to be able to organize and take an illegal wildlife trade together. So, well, what can we do from a uh, strategic perspective. Well, globally, we need to understand that this is a strategic problem 
that require strategic solutions. Wildlife crime has always been with us. The illegal wildlife trade is also global and it's not going away. So we need to be strategic in fighting it. But how do we do that? I mentioned earlier a number of different frameworks from CITES to CBD. These are each individual nails, but you cannot do the house from nails. Globally, we need to have frameworks that take into account the criminality that is involved as well as the broad scale of species that are involved in illegal wildlife trade. Not just CITES. Thirdly, we need to manage environmental crime as a serious crime because it's still from all of us. It undermines national and international policy objectives and is a predicate crime to other things, as we saw earlier. There is a lot of other crimes, human trafficking, financial security crime that are going on and are perpetrated by people who are committing wildlife crimes. Environmental crime results in environmental degradation. Environmental degradation undermines the security of every country, but it results in increased poverty or radicalization or desertification. We need to look at environmental crime as a security issue, and it is the same security issues for every country. So there is a lot to be done. And of course, China has a very important role on the world stage to contribute. Its knowledge, its experience, and most of all, its people. Every country needs to work to eliminate wildlife crime if we are truly going to live up to today's scene and build a shared future for our life. I look forward to hearing my colleague presenters as we go on this evening. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of the discussion today and tomorrow. So this is quite awkward, but I will give the floor back to Mr. Sheldon Jordan. Thanks a lot. So thank you. And once again, my apologies for missing. We had a large number of storms that came through central Canada yesterday, and it, uh, and it really knocked out the electricity for a long time in a lot of places. But thank you for uh, presenting on my behalf and uh, looking forward to hearing uh, more, uh, more presentations or more uh, discussions. Thank you. So thank you for coming in for that it's fantastic to have you here and of course having you to answer the questions is going to be fundamentally important so now we have time for a panel discussion the fourth speaker for this session sadly couldn't make it um a sunday evening is difficult for people to attend so does anyone have any questions for any of the panel he's here adam hi Oh, Adam is here. <laughs> yes. Perfect timing. Would you like to share your slides with us? Or if Good you afternoon. have slides, that is. I will just speak off the cuff. And okay. uh, thank you so much for giving me the floor. Uh, hi, dear colleagues and everybody who's watching us from uh, wherever you may be. My name is Adam Skasinga. And I am representing a local nonprofit here in the DR Congo called Conserve Congo. And I know many of you may not be acquainted with where the Congo is, which is usually confused with the People's Republic of the Congo. We are neighbors, but definitely two different countries. Uh, in case you want me to give you a clue as to where the Congo is, the Congo is that large country right in the heart of the continent. And uh, we are the only African country which has got nine neighbors. And we are also the only African country which has got two different time zones. So you can imagine how big we are. We are the second largest country right after Algeria. That's in terms of uh, land mass. Thank you so much. I am going to be talking to you about wildlife trafficking, especially the illicit wildlife trafficking in the country, uh, internationally, and otherwise. So Conserve Congo has been in existence for the last uh, 10 years. We're entering our 10th year uh, next year. And uh, one of our main objectives is to fight the scourge of wildlife trafficking. And we do that through law enforcement. We have been working with our government for the last five years now. And uh, we are doing a pretty, uh, pretty very good job because before Conserve Congo, nobody really knew about the crisis that we were living here in the DRC 
and the ties that our country had to the international illicit wildlife trafficking. Before I go further into my speech, I am going to address some of the causes of wildlife trafficking. And I know there is this cliche about the demand and the supply, but there are other uh, bigger and direct reasons which are linked to the international illicit wildlife trafficking, which goes beyond just greed. And I think the biggest one is ignorance. Uh, you may be surprised how many people here locally and internationally who do not know about uh, wildlife trafficking as well as its impacts. But you may also be surprised as to how many people think they understand the crisis of wildlife trafficking, but literally they've got, um, uh, they've got wrong information. So on top of ignorance, we do have corruption. In fact, corruption is what I call the greasing mechanism of uh, the trafficking machinery, that without corruption, there is no wildlife trafficking. In fact, there won't be any trafficking at all. But the most prominent one currently and here locally in our country is food insecurity. There are so many people who wouldn't poach if they had something else to eat. And sometimes I think wildlife trafficking as we know it, because it's basically about trafficking live animals as well as the products which de derive from them, is, uh, is just uh, as a result of food insecurity because most people would go into the forest just to look for food and this becomes just a collateral damage. But do we have consequences in terms of wildlife trafficking? Yes, we do have very dear consequences that we hardly ever talk about. The biggest one and the most talked about is that it disturbs our biodiversity. As you may know, uh, the, the DR Congo has got about 80% of the Congo Basin Forest. The Congo Basin Forest is the second largest forest in the world after the Amazon. So if we were going to say the Amazon is the right lung of humanity, the Congo Basin qualifies to be the other lung of humanity. Not many people even know about uh, this fact, but the more we poach, the more trafficking goes on, the more the biodiversity of this forest is going to be disturbed. And at the end of the day, it's going to lead to uh, the phenomenon referred to otherwise as the empty forest phenomenon, which is going to affect the sequestration of uh, carbon and uh, the emission of uh, oxygen, which is going to affect all of us globally, not only as a Congolese citizen. And of course, wildlife trafficking also disturbs our economy. For instance, currently we have a very little or very non-existent uh, tourism industry, which otherwise would have brought a lot of uh, foreign currency, job creation to our country. And unfortunately, the tourism uh, industry in our country is very uh, much crippled because uh, mainly of uh, wildlife trafficking as well as poaching. Wildlife trafficking also affects our security. Uh, you may understand that before you can traffic wildlife, you have to kill it first. And by killing it, there are guns and uncontrolled uh, possession as well as uh, use of weapons. And in our case, it's, it's, it's currently uh, war rifles which are being utilized. Uh, you have got uh, thugs who have found a safe haven in our national parks. And sometimes they wear a political uh, uh, casket where, while they are trying to serve themselves to our natural heritage in order to finance uh, these rebel movements and other armed groups. And eventually there is mass displacement of people. There are kidnappings and rapes and which results in a very huge uh, humanitarian crisis. And of course, lastly, uh, you have the cultural aspect. This is our natural heritage we inherited from our forefathers 
and which we should, under normal circumstances, leave to other generations to come. And suddenly we have got people stealing from that natural heritage for their own selfish uh, gains. And that kind of disturbs our cultural heritage. And at the end of the day, we become like an irresponsible citizenry, which is stealing from itself, especially stealing from their own children. Conserve Congo has uh, been in action for the last decade. And we have been working on a variety of issues, trying to, to contain the crisis caused by wildlife trafficking. We are the only organization that does what we do at grassroots level here in our country. But also lately we have been operating even in all nine countries that border our country. We have been working on a variety of uh, species and currently we work on elephants, we work on pangolins, we work on uh, primates in general, we work on great apes, we work on the okapi, we also work on felines. In the last 10 years, we have, we have worked on over 6,000 cases of wildlife trafficking in and outside of our country. Of the 6,000 cases, only 10% have been prosecuted. And I must just highlight that before Conserve Congo was in existence here in the DR Congo, nobody had ever spent a day in prison because of an environmental crime. We assisted our country in 2018 to prosecute the first ever wildlife case in a court of law in 2018. And that was a great success for the conservation world. Only 10% uh, of these cases have been uh, prosecuted so far. That's quite minute compared to the size of the problem. However, we have made a lot of progress because uh, just four or five years before that, there was zero prosecution. Of the 10% of prosecutions, we have gotten between 2,500 and 3,000 poachers where they belong, behind bars. And the latest case was the seizure which we occasioned with the authorities on the 14th of May, and in which we seized a contraband amounting to two tons. Three thugs were put behind bars and the case is still ongoing. So far, we have shifted from uh, the seizures we have made, which uh, until 14th of May were sitting at six tons, now they have increased to eight tons. Eight tons of ivory which has been seized during our existence to date, which represent almost 500 uh, murdered elephants. We know that we cannot bring them back, but at least uh, the perpetrators have gotten what they, they, they deserve. In the same process, we have rescued about 98 apes we have occasioned the seizure of about six tons of pangolins. We have rescued 11 pangolins and which has been, have been sent back to the wild. We have uh, recovered about 194 feline, feline hides. That includes lions, leopards, and other small felines. We have rescued about 385 birds and the latest being 123 African graves, which were recovered when a, a trafficker was arrested uh, by the Uganda Wildlife uh, Authority. Seven reptiles have been also uh, rescued. 17 okapi hides were also recovered in the process, as well as 24 liters of okapi oil. You may wonder what are we doing in the last five years which we did not do in the past. The secret is synergy. In the last five years, we have come together and we have put our efforts together with our government. We have elaborated a strategic plan which we have put in motion. And we have decided that the DRC is no longer going to be a safe haven for traffickers. 
When you talk of African wildlife trafficking, we do believe that uh, the DRC plays a very major role being uh, in its strategic geopolitical positioning. We receive at least 85% of other products coming from other countries, be it the South, the East, the West, and the North. But also the DRC remains one of the major source countries in terms of wildlife uh, trafficking. And you're going to notice that at every level, each time uh, wildlife trafficking is talked about in Africa, the DRC is going to be mentioned. There are so many other causes which put us in that position, such as corruption. The corruption is very much rife in our country. And uh, while these products are moving from one place to the other, Corruption plays a major role because palms are being greased in the process. We also have lawlessness. Even though we've got the most elaborate with very harsh sentences, laws and texts, the law is hardly ever applied. And thanks to the collaboration between the state, the civil society that we are part of, as well as other international partners, we are trying to make sure that those laws cease to be just text and they be applied according to the need which made them exist in the first place. We also have a challenge of uh, having a very large country, which is the size of the entire Eastern Europe, but which has got no uh, facilities and infrastructures allowing us to reach every nook and corner at the time that we really need. And this becomes a very huge challenge because easily wildlife trafficking can shift from one corner to the other. And as we may have known, wildlife trafficking is a very, is a very challenging issue which keeps changing. It's a very complex problem that we have to be changing with if we have to keep up and control its movement. At this stage, after achieving all that we have achieved, we can say that the problem is still very big. And for us to be able to contain the problem at our level, we do believe that there has to be a stimulation of the political will. For as long as there won't be any political will to fight wildlife trafficking, it is going to be a huge problem. We need to vote for policies which not only protect the wildlife, but also which protects the people who live with this wildlife. If we are going to be protecting the biodiversity, there is no way we can touch wildlife from humanity. We are called to live together and therefore the solutions should always enforce that cohabitation between humans and wildlife. The second recommendation is going to be working in synergy. As it is, we are working with government, we are working with other foreign governments, mainly from countries that are our neighbors, but also we need to bring in communities and we need to make sure that the communities understand that they are the custodians of their wildlife. Otherwise, it is going to be an issue of us against them and it is not going to work to our advantage. We also need to increase funding for grassroots organizations such as Concert Congo. You're going to notice that we are the people who live on the ground. We understand perfectly the problems that we are facing. We understand the issues that are within our communities. Just like uh, Mrs. Ms. Nkiru said earlier, the cohabitation between Africans and wildlife dates back from centuries. And today we are not going to change and think that that has changed. That has not changed. In fact, to the opposite, we feel like uh, the custodians of this wildlife feel like they have been sidelined and uh, other people are making decisions on their behalf. So involving uh, our communities is going to be a very, very uh, important part of uh, tackling this issue. And of course, that the biggest chunk of funding goes down to, to grassroots organizations, which are in touch with the reality on the ground. 
In order to count ignorance, we need to intensify education. And education is not only uh, about educating uh, the locals. Even people who think that they know should also be educated as to how they are going to fit into the community's needs. They need to, to understand how the culture uh, of the locals also operate. Because to some people, uh, tackling wildlife trafficking is just an issue of security or a professional issue. But to us as Africans, there is still also a cultural aspect to it. And you may see that if you take that into consideration, it's going to ease the process of tackling the problem and ultimately finding a solution. And of course, there is a point where we need to get alternatives. There is a big issue with food insecurity, with most land that has been occupied by the locals being transformed into uh, uh, um, preserved areas, it becomes a problem for them to have alternatives. And if they do not have alternative ways of living, they are going to attack the closest uh, resource which is near them and which is going to be uh, the forest, the wild uh, animals, and so on and so forth. But if we are proactive and uh, address alternative ways to address these issues, we are going to be just fine. We also recommend that we have a special pot for wildlife criminals. And when we talk of this, we do not say a new institution should be established, but we can put a mechanism into place which makes wildlife cases a priority. But we cannot do that until we educate people enough to understand that this is an emergency and the sooner we address it, the better. I have been to Uganda. We have got uh, partners there and they are having this mechanism in place and it is really yielding the results. We have been to Kenya and we've got colleagues there and this system of prioritizing wildlife crimes in courts of law has been really uh, a mechanism that assists not only in prosecuting these bad guys, but also in making it smooth and sending a message of deterrence out there to would be criminals for wildlife. Before I conclude, I just wanted to say that uh, the problem is bigger than what uh, most people are thinking. And I know that before Conserve Congo, not many people knew uh, the kind of issues that we faced here in the DR Congo pertaining to wildlife trafficking. And while the world is singing this song about the pangolin being uh, the most trafficked uh, mammal uh, in the world, here in the Congo primates are still paying uh, the price. And the reason why primates are the ones paying the price mainly is because of the bushmeat crisis. I'm one of the few who still believe that the biggest problem and as well as the money making um, out of the entire wildlife trafficking sphere is bush meat. Every week we've got about 15 tons of bush meat which uh, gets into the EU zone and which goes as far as entering Washington on a weekly basis. And that's just from Kinshasa. I'm not talking about other neighboring countries. This has become a very big issue because Anything that is bushmeat is not specified in terms of species. Bushmeat looks like bushmeat. Once he smokes, they'll cut off the hoofs, they'll cut off the claws, they'll cut off the head, and you wouldn't tell what is what. That is another urgent issue which needs to be addressed. And to allow you to have more questions for us, that is going to be all that I have to say. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Adam, for an enlightening talk. We've had a selection of really good talks this evening, so it's great to hear everyone. Um, we're going to have a question session now for the four speakers from this session. Um, so if Winnie and um, 
all of the speakers from the session could turn on your camera because I think it's nice for them to see people when they're asking questions. I've got a couple of general questions that have been posted in the chat or privately. And I'm also going to ask some general uh, questions to everyone here. So first off, let's just start with, we'll start off with some general questions. So a question to all three of you. What do you see as the biggest challenge to preventing unsustainable wildlife trade? And also, what is something that gives you hope of addressing some of the challenges we now face? So because Winnie was the first speaker, Winnie, if you would like to start with those questions and then we'll have uh, Sheldon and then Adam. I don't think there's a single answer because this is a very complex uh, question. Uh, but as all the speakers have highlighted, there are those issues that, uh, there are those things that we absolutely have to do. First of all, how we communicate and who we communicate to is very, very important. I think that there is so many gaps in information right from our political leaders to those that interact with species that have no idea where these species come from, and then our people on the, in the, on the ground, just to get them to understand that they are being robbed of resources that are important for the sustenance of healthy ecosystems and for the future of their children. So how we communicate is so, so important. There is such a big role for grassroots organizations as Adams has very well articulated. Where we put our money, there's a lot of money that was spent in the last maybe 15 years from 2012, when the issue of illegal ivory trade became a big issue, a lot of funding was put towards organizations that are able to communicate their case, but grassroots organizations that are the ones that stay with the people, that are the ones that understand how complex these issues are in the hearts and minds of the people, who understand how corruption works in these networks, who are really where the rubber meets the road, have not received adequate attention and funding. And therefore, we need to rethink where the impact is. We need to put the money where most of the impact exists. And for me, um, what, another thing that has worked is to realize where the most impactful decisions can be made especially in the legal and policy environment. And I have seen working in the Elephant Protection Initiative that five minutes with heads of state and government who are able to understand and articulate the issue is more valuable than 10 days in a conference carrying my briefcase and talking to people who have known all my life. So I know that there are people who can take high political impactful decisions, but to reach them is difficult. And so we must not be shy, we must not be lazy, we must recognize this high level, high value business. If annually we are talking about billions of dollars, those who are in the trade are also talking at a very high level. The amounts of money they spend on corruption, they don't pay the policeman on the street. They pay that money very high up. And so we need to be where they are also having impact. Thank you. Thank you, Winnie, for highlighting that. I think that's a really important lesson for many of those listening, but influencing the people who have power is critical if we're going to see change. And I know I've heard many people note that one of the reasons behind the success of the Climate Convention relative to the Biodiversity Convention is the people debating climate are the, the prime ministers, the ones with power. And we have to move beyond the point where biodiversity is seen as the secondary extra to showing that it is our life support machine. And we need the people who have power to be listening to us so that they can make those decisions. Uh, Sheldon, if you would like to answer those same questions next with your own perspectives, that would be great. 
So thank you, Alice. And I couldn't agree with yourself and with Winnie more. Um, it really is a question about creating awareness and creating awareness in the right places. There are many, many people around the world who live with wildlife and who live with wildlife crime every single day around them. And it's on all of the continents and on all of the oceans. Um, but as mentioned, um, we have the challenge of number one, uh, convincing people who are either the harvesters or the uh, consumers that this is a problem. Um, going back to Adam's comments earlier, there really is in many places a food security issue or an economic security issue. People don't um, get themselves involved in illegal forestry or fishery or whatever just because they think that it's a, a good thing to do. They do it because they need to survive. Um, and that contributes to the illegality. Secondly, uh, Winnie's uh, remark about spending 10 minutes with somebody in power as opposed to 10 days in conventions with people that we already know, um, that sometimes feels like my experience of the last 20 years. <laughs> and, and, and we do spend a lot of time talking to each other. Um, but um, as Winnie mentioned, you know, the climate crisis is real. The climate crisis really does need taking on. But even if we take on the climate crisis, if we don't take on the biodiversity crisis, there's not going to be anything left. These need to be taken hand in hand. And taking it on from the illegal trade perspective, I think is very important because the illegality contributes to all the food insecurity, contributes to, um, to, to, to national and economic insecurity. And this really has to be seen more as just going after people who shoot cute animals. Thank you for that. And it's the perfect point, I think, for Adam to jump in there. Um, many of the discussions around wildlife trade in the pandemic have also focused on the place that wildlife trade and wildlife consumption plays within the African continent. So it'd be great if you could also pick up on that challenging balance between people accessing a livelihood and the survival of these species, as well as the risk of disease. You're muted, Adam, if you could unmute yourself. Thank you so much, Alice. Um, and, I, and I think the DRC is one of the most, uh, the countries which are not understood in terms of uh, conservation. And I think uh, it becomes our obligation to let the people be aware of what we face. The situation we face in the DRC is quite different from any other countries. For instance, I think when uh, Dr. Kiru speaks, you can see that she knows about the figures that she's talking about. She knows from experience. Here in the DRC, we have a problem. The biggest problem we have, we do not have the latest inventories of our natural resources. And it's not only in wildlife, it is also in mining and other spheres of life. So that alone, becomes a problem because we cannot protect and preserve what we don't know. To date in the DRC, we are still having species which are being discovered. And we are pretty much sure that we have a huge reserve of species and, and subspecies in the dense forests of the Congo, which nobody has ever taken the time to go and discover. I'm going to speak about uh, the African gray in particular. We have been under moratorium since 2016, meaning we cannot export any uh, African grays. But I can tell you that from my investigations, every year from 2016 to date, we lose up to 12,000 pieces every year in the illicit wildlife trafficking. And they go out internationally through our airports, through our, our borders, and they do get side permits, allowing them to do that. So my question is, if CIDIS itself has put a halt to it, not knowing how many we have in the, in the wild, how would that be uh, sustainable? It is going to be problematic. We also have uh, 
a problem in terms of resources. We have, we probably are amongst those few countries which still say we cannot do this because we do not have money to do it. If you spoke to our government, they will tell you literally there is no money to protect uh, species in the wild. We do not have enough park rangers in our country. We have about 75 plus protected areas in the DR Congo. We only have 3,200 park rangers. As Conserve Congo, as Conserve Congo, we work, we work in a field of 2,000, uh, 2, 2,440-something thousand square kilometers. It means with our personnel of about 104, one individual does investigations on a land, on a landmass the size of Rwanda. So when we tell people that we have got 104 staff members, it sounds large. But when you put it compared to the size of the country that we have to operate in, it's quite minute. And I'm not going to talk on behalf of government, but I know the resources needed for us to, to address the issue of inventory, the issue of community uh, conservation in our country is quite huge. And until we sort out all those nitty gritties, we cannot talk about sustainable trade of wildlife. We need to sort our house out first. We need to put it in order before we can say, okay, this is excess and we can trade in this. And, and of course, I think the last issue is going to be corruption and I will not get tired of addressing the issue of corruption. In this whole issue, how do we tackle corruption? Once we can contain those three issues, I think we'll be ready now to talk about a sustainable legal way of trade in wildlife. Thank you, Adam. And those are some really important points that I think all of those listening really need to understand. And we can be as ambitious as we want. If there is not the infrastructure, if there is not the finance, then it's going to remain a fiction. And this is something, again, I think the West is often largely unaware of. And the fact that we need to use funding like that of the Jeff to ensure that countries have the resources to conserve their biodiversity. We also see climate has a huge amount of funding at the moment. And yet how much funding is going into protecting these critical areas like parts of the Congo versus making a great green wall in Afri in parts of Africa or planting the billion tree tsunami in Pakistan. I think we need to ask governments to realign their policies to support countries to protect their biodiversity because once it's gone, it's gone. And so many countries, especially recovering from the COVID pandemic, there is a need for economic recovery. If countries don't have the resources to do it, they cannot choose between what their, their populations need and biodiversity. They do not have that luxury and developed countries need to help them in order to ensure that that biodiversity has a, uh, has a future. Um, we only have a few minutes left, I'm afraid. I'm sure that this discussion could go for a long time and everyone's made some really important points. So in the last five minutes, if anyone has anything brief they would like to add as a closing thought, just to underscore a major message that they want those listening to understand, it would be fantastic. So Winnie, if you would like to add any last thoughts first and then we'll have Adam and um, Sheldon. Okay, I just want to to really express my gratitude that uh, uh, this on this very important day um, we have been given this opportunity not just to speak but also to listen. I was in from the first session and I did not know enough about uh, this discussion on DSI. I have heard, I have been involved in some of the discussions in my country and I, I'm, I'm very thankful for all the information that has been shared and really all I must say is that we need all hands on deck. Everybody do what you can, where you can, because this is a complex problem, but we cannot be steeped in despair. The wildlife needs us, the species need us, 
our children and our grandchildren will look at us kindly if we do our bit. And I believe that none of what we are doing will be, will go to waste. Our little bit, wherever we are, is going to make a big piece, which will ensure the survival of some of the species. Even if we can't save everything, let's save what we can. Thank you. Thank you, Winnie. Sheldon. So I think from my point of view, really when you're looking at it as uh, uh, an illegality uh, challenge, uh, two things. One was awareness, which I spoke to earlier. The second really is around collaboration and working together. Um, wildlife crime is local, it is regional, it is international. And we need people, number one, to be aware of this issue and the impact that it has on the economy, on security, on food security, on all sorts of other things. And we need to have them working together at the local, subnational, national, and international levels. Um, I still see so many things, and, and I've been very involved on the international level for a number of years where there is a lot of emphasis and a lot of focus on charismatic megafauna and wildlife crime is so, so much bigger than that. So let's leverage the charismatic megafauna to bring awareness to the question and build it out from there. But what we do need, we need people like Adam who is in civil society, Winnie, myself who comes from government, working together and we need the countries to work together, the Chinas, the Kenyas, the Congos, the Canadas, uh, putting their, 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 their best leadership forward because these are complex problems, but there's nothing that we cannot overcome if we don't collaborate. Thank you, Sheldon. Adam, some last words. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, while I echo every bit of uh, what my uh, a predecessor have mentioned, and I'm not going to dwell on that, but the only thing I can say is uh, let's put that into action now. Let's put that synergy into action. We have spoken about it, and it goes to say that all of us are thinking the same thing. But if we are already thinking it, let's get down and do it. Uh, we are looking forward to seeing Kenya collaborating with the DRC, the DRC collaborating with South Africa, South Africa collaborating with uh, Nigeria. And this way, these criminals will not have a place to hide. And while he and the DRC, we may think we know it all, maybe somebody from Uganda is going to say, hey, uh, don't go so fast. Maybe we try this, maybe we try that. And I've heard numerous times, uh, People say we have fought wildlife trafficking and it's no longer part of our, of, our, of our country. But usually it is a lie. It's usually that it is now going under the radar. The point that I keep bringing about is that we do not have a single rhino alive here in the Congo, but we have the largest stock of uh, a rhino contraband in the entire world is plenty of rhino horn around here because buyers are there, nobody's bothering traffickers. But if Namibia is not communicating with us, they would not know. If South Africa is not communicating with us, they wouldn't know. If Kenya is not doing the same, they would think that they are containing the problem, but they're not. So the communication between government, civil society, international, national organizations, regional bodies, Immediately, we're going to be on the same level. And this is going to be time effective, but also cost effective, because we will stop double booking. Instead of using two organizations chasing after the same network, we are going to lobby. And together, we're going to have a single mechanism attacking that network and surely bring it down without wasting a lot of resources, especially time. Thank you for that, Adam. So communicate, collaborate, and also use things like the tools that Interpol and others have been using to ensure that information is available when it's needed. Yes. Um, I'd love to continue this discussion and sadly there isn't time. I'm really grateful for everyone's insights tonight as I'm sure all those listening will be. We've covered some really important topics and this is an absolutely critical year for those thoughts with CITES on the horizon, 